You know that's how I'm going to open this, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's the deal with podcasts? They're not in a pod. They're not casting anything. It's just a radio, but it's on the internet. Don't these people have a radio? Don't you think that there's enough stuff out there already? Why does everyone have one? I don't have one. Not everyone needs a podcast. Don't we have enough crap going around and around the internet? You know, the other day I was listening to this new podcast. This brother and sister team trying to go through all of pop culture and determine whether or not you should have it on your shelf. Do we really need these people? Who are the people that can't figure this out for themselves? Do we really need all of this information? Do you really need a three hour long podcast about a 22 minute show? Why do you need to have something on your shelf once you have it on and you've listened to it once? It's crazy! They call it shelf life! I'm Jerry Seinfeld! Bad Seinfeld oppression aside, I am Kevin. And I'm Rachel. And this is Shelf Life! (laughs) That's not even good. Like, he doesn't go to that range most of the time. Most of the time, he's in this range, and he's talking, you know, like this. But then, because of the show, we always want to go like this! Well, because anytime there's any stress, he just goes up the high! I'm a baby! (laughs) (laughs) This is Shelf Life, a podcast where a brother and sister team go through all the world of pop culture, both past, present, and future. And we determine whether or not it deserves a place on your shelf. We do this for movies, TV, games, books, video games, comics, sports, sports entertainment, music, and anything else that the fans, the friends, and the listeners want us to go through. For those of you that are new to the show or are finding the show because of the subject we are doing today, Rachel, what is up for contention today on the shelf? I mean, if it wasn't obvious by the stand-up that we started (laughs) off with. The worst stand-up and Seinfeld impression you've ever heard. We're doing B-movie! We're doing the B-movie! Oh my god! I'm a B! (laughs) We might as well do the damn B-movie with that impression. Because that's the that's the voice he does. He's he does doing an, that voice. He does an impression of himself for the entire yes. B movie. Yes. yes. Oh God. But no, we'll get there. We'll get there eventually. <laughs> we're when doing. When we get to B movie, we we really are like, we're re- we're either like oh, we're at the I, bottom of the barrel that, here, or it's like I guess we'll do B movie. <laughs> I'm like, sorry. Oh, what goes with the rest of these? Uh, I guess the B movie. <sighs> the theme for this season was B movie. B movie is the main <laughs> oh, event. Oh, wait, wait a minute! It could be B movies with oh, the B movie. I like it. <laughs> I like that idea. All right, uh, mark it no, down. No, 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 season no, no. season seventeen. <laughs> we're doing all B movies with B movie. <laughs> That's the kicker. Now we have to do it because I said it. Oh, we do. We do. Okay. Anyway, Rachel, <laughs> what is up on the sh- shelf today? We will or be doing for the shelf. season one Seinfeld. Season. Or if you watched the first episode, the, the pilot, the Seinfeld Chronicles with the old theme, the theme before Seinfeld. Ooh. It's atrocious. It is not. It is not. (laughs) Hang on. I've got to play it so that I can. No, no. I can do the jukebox. Because someone, someone. Let's see. Okay. The original Seinfeld theme. A lot of tambourine. Do 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 do
do do do do do do do do do <laughs> it's really bad it reminds me of the community the troy and abed like do 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 Oh, I like community. <laughs> Don't we'll get there. We've got it on the list. But we've got to start here. So for those that are new or those that are have been keeping track of the theme for season one, whatever you want to call it, our first trek through the shelf. If you haven't noticed what we've been doing with the TV shows, we've done three TV shows, or we will do three TV shows. I don't know where the hell you're putting this, Rachel, but in the order. <laughs> so Don't worry about cut, it. <laughs> cut, cut out whatever part I said wrong. We've got The Simpsons. We've got Twilight Zone. And now we're doing Seinfeld. Three television shows that either inf- influenced us or we grew up with directly mm-hmm. or were influences to the future of everything directly or indirectly. Yeah. For Seinfeld, to me, it's both. Oh, I... Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Seinfeld is pretty much a sitcom, but I don't know why I went Doc Brown there for a second. Sitcom. <laughs> oh, no. A... Not again. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault. Every time. The main event this season is not Back to the Future. Folks. <laughs> so don't think that because I keep doing that, that you're getting Back to the Future yet. We have to save that for when we're good at this. What was I saying? Oh, so... <laughs> That it's a sitcom. It's a sitcom. It's a sitcom. (laughs) And it has traditional sitcom tropes. It's a three camera. It's got a laugh. It doesn't have a laugh track, but it has a studio audience. Right. And typically, I would say I really do not like that genre. I don't like sitcoms. I might have watched them as a kid, but nowadays, and even trying to watch old sitcoms, I can't do it. It's a little cringy. Seinfeld is totally different in my mind and i don't know if that's rose colored glasses and it's not really that different or if it really is different well, and it go ahead no well, i'm thinking that it is like a sitcom right it's got like the casing of a sitcom but in the middle of it it's just like a comedian stand-up it's or, I, or like an improv group it feels kind of like an improv it group. feels like a to me it feels like a stage play Yes. It feels like, because it feels like these actors, the live audience and the way that they cut the laugh track in with the jokes makes it feel more like you're watching a play. Right. Then that you're, you're, you're actually sitting in the audience. Yeah, yeah. And I think maybe that helps because it's not a bang theory laugh track. Like, you know, it's not fake. You, does that make sense? Like, the audience is reacting with, with the actors, right. the characters. They're, they yes. are, and to your point, it's like a comedian's stand up because they're trying they're playing not just for you at home watching the show but they're playing to get the for audience people, to react to get yeah. into it yeah. especially michael richards right he knows how to play that audience yes he does <laughs> but we're starting here with seinfeld it's acclaimed as one of the best television shows of all time i'm curious to know and folks at home let us know are you, did you grow up with seinfeld like we did do you know what it is is it something that your parents grew up with we have younger listeners or you know have you never been exposed to seinfeld this is your chance because we're we're gonna go through all 180 episodes sooner or later and (laughs) uh we're 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 starting here with season one and again we find ourselves in the year 1989 to 1990 because we're just, we're stuck in 1990 here on Shelf yeah, Life. Why can't we get out of this? Well, because that's the, you know, that's the, I'm going to make another Back to the Future reference. But the center of, you know, the center of time, Doc is like, maybe is 1955 the nexus of all time? Maybe 1990 was the nexus of all time. We got this, we got the <laughs> Simpsons. Maybe it was just the time to change the game. Was like Maybe it was. To change television. A lot with, of with stuff happened within, like... The 20 years before and the 20 years after. A lot of things happened. (laughs) Uh, So, Rachel, I'll let you go first and give your... Since since the way that we've done this, when we start a new television show, is we give our impressions of how we feel about that TV show in general, and then we give you a little bit of the backstory on how that TV show came together, and then we'll start going and running down and going episode by episode. But... I want to start with you and, and what your what your initial thoughts are, what your history is, what your past is with Seinfeld, how you feel generally about the show. Honestly, I mean, with Seinfeld, it, this is, we grew up with this. 
and I think it is one of the bases for all of the references I make throughout my days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's probably not a day goes by, at least when, when you and I talk, that it, there isn't a Seinfeld reference. Oh, my god. And, gosh. I mean, there, I have friends, at least a couple of friends, my college roommate and I, one of my best friends growing up, and I, there's a Seinfeld reference being made every time we talk to each other. Mm-hmm. By hook or by crook. Like, there's at least one side oh, yeah. reference. Absolutely. Even if it's just, like, just the tone of how you're saying right, something. Yeah, it doesn't even have it, to be something It literally is just, Seinfeld, like, right. But it's Seinfeldian Yeah, Seinfeldian. Nature. That's a good way of saying it. And but, it is. I mean, like, there is a certain tone to it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There might not be... There, well, okay, there may not be, all, not all of the episodes are going to be wonderful. They're not like, oh, wonderful. every episode is just wonderful. But <laughs> but usually there's we'll, like we'll, jokes we'll in know. every one that like, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, that's funny. Oh, yeah, I reference that still. Oh, yeah. Right. You get well, that I, still. I said that to you when I went back to watch these because season one, I don't. Season one, I thought folks at home, and maybe we will get through them. And I was like, oh, we can get through season one all in one one shot. And because I just remember them being flat and pretty dry. And maybe like they, they are, haven't maybe they gotten to that point yet. They don't of, like knowing themselves. Do it for you. Yet. They don't do it for me. How but... are we referencing that one a lot? Jeez. <laughs> yeah, that was two Spaceball references in a row for those that didn't quite <laughs> catch it. <laughs> Spaceballs is also Spaceballs also isn't the main event this season, but it's you're getting warm. So <laughs> yeah, we're getting closer now. Sci-fi, Spaceballs, stepping in the, stepping in the poopy. Huh. Hmm. Anyway, doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> no, that's what I was trying to say. Damn it! <laughs> but we're not doing that either. To me, it was charming to see because there is stuff. There's plenty of stuff for us to talk about in these episodes that are going to keep it at shelf length length, which we know all of you <laughs> love. Absolutely. So like you said, for the, the Simpsons episode where you said it was something that was on during dinner. Yes. I think so the was same this. way. Yeah, exactly. I think this was after dinner. That's so true. In, in this syndication, is like cleaning up dinner. <laughs> in syndication, it was always where we grew up. It was always The Simpsons is on at dinner, and then Seinfeld was on right after dinner. Yes. So it was always, well, homework's not getting done. I'm going to go watch these. Yeah, I'm going to finish the this Simpsons first. And Seinfeld, and then maybe I'll get that homework done. And, and I think that's how I pretty much watched all of Seinfeld was through syndication. I don't think I ever watched it live. I don't. I'll, I don't think I did. I think we were too young to watch it live. Right. The only thing I'll say is I the one memory I have of watching Seinfeld live was we were on vacation during the Seinfeld finale. And I remember Grandma. I do remember that. I remember Grandma taping it for us. I, and I guess because it was such a big deal because this was such a big show by that point. And we still were watching it in the hotel room. We still had it on. Right. And because it was just that big of a deal to have the Seinf the Seinfeld finale on. That's all I kind of remember about watching it live. Because I really don't ever remember mom and dad watching it, but like, who knows? I just don't remember. Right. But I do remember the way that I and you too, we watched it through syndication. And then, yeah. and it became part of it was, our. It was reruns. Yeah, it was in reruns. And it became part of our, our sayings and what we kind of love to do and all this stuff. Yeah. So there's a special place in our hearts for Seinfeld as a show. And. Uh, and we have to remember kind of the humble beginnings that this show had. This show was not supposed to make it. No. This show was not supposed to be as big as it became. This was not supposed to be a highlight for NBC or Castle Rock or Sony Pictures or anybody. It was it was just it was kind of a happy accident that everything just fell into place, that the people were so good at what they did mm -hmm. and that everyone was patient enough to watch this show develop because, and I'm sure I'll repeat myself when we get to the later seasons of Seinfeld. If you watch the first few seasons of Seinfeld, it truly is a show about just people talking and everyday problems. And then by the second half of the show, like seasons five through nine or six through nine, it becomes like a vaudeville show. It's still a stage play, 
but now it's like a vaudeville act mm-hmm. and even and those episodes are fun too just for a different reason because they're just right. wacky they're wacky but they're still like talking about things that are every day right it's a, it's a it's a fun show and, and i know like a lot of people that haven't uh, younger people might not have caught on to it but definitely give it a shot like i said we have to kind of remember the humble beginnings of this show it started as in the early 80s or mid 80s jerry seinfeld was a comedian uh and a very well-established comedian he would do the tonight show on johnny carson he would do different gigs and he was well known as a good comedian and he was a mm-hmm. he's one of the best comedians of all time his stand up is great i've read a couple of books about seinfeld i've watched a documentary about the making of seinfeld so i'm not doing this with notes in front of me so we may have to go back and you know edit my thoughts but i think i think i can get the gist of it okay. I, I, <laughs> I watched an episode of Matlock in the in a bar last night. The sound wasn't on, but I think I got the gist of it. Well, I think what you were gonna part of it. What I was thinking is it. He's famous, right? He's like, oh, he might be one of the best, but he's he's one of the most copied or made fun of as well because that type of com- comedy where it's like, what's the deal with? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a type unto itself, right? Because he's a very optimistic comedian. He's not, a lot of comedy is about just how shitty life is. And Jerry's isn't necessarily how shitty life is. It's just like how weird life is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like how weird everyday life can be. Yeah. And it's almost like these little things. It's the little things that Jerry's looking for. It's not like, oh, women be shopping or take my wife, please. It's not that. Right. it's, It's these little things that Jerry's comedy is. I don't know. It's very hard to explain. Because it is, to your point, it's so parodied now. Exactly. It's so it's even parodied on the show towards you know the more mature seasons where they make fun of them like, so what kind of come out comedy did you do? Do you a lot of that? Did you ever notice type of stuff? <laughs> yeah, like... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a an agent named Greg Shapiro who kept trying, wanted to get him a deal with NBC. I don't know why he, Greg Shapiro must have known people at NBC or something, but his agent was trying to get him some sort of deal with NBC. And I think his agent thought that he could get him maybe a special, maybe some kind of show, maybe like be on a show or something like that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he thought like his own show, but what ends up happening, it's very similar. If you've seen season four of Seinfeld, where they do them getting a chance to do a show, it, it is the satire of that pretty beat for beat. So right. Greg Shapiro invites some NBC execs to come watch a set of Jerry's and they come and they watch the set and they like it. And they call Jerry in to have a discussion about what to do. And Jerry decides to tell, this is where I'm going to get a little bit confused. So apologies if I get the story a little bit wrong. We'll, we'll put it in a, you know, put in a retraction or whatever (laughs) but he goes and he tells his friend larry david who was another comedian uh, about this opportunity that's come up at nbc and he asks larry because larry had experience writing larry wrote for snl he wrote for some other variety show i can't remember the name he had experience writing and famously, Larry says in a documentary that he never, he got one of his sketches on SNL uh, to actually make air, and it aired like five minutes before the show went off the air, <laughs> which is the worst time to have a sketch air. Sure. Um, so, like, he did not think of himself as a successful comedy writer, mm-hmm. but he was also a stand up comedian. So he went in with Jerry to talk with the NBC execs. And the idea of the show to begin with was that it was just going to be a special. It was going to be like an hour and a half special. And the idea that they had was it was a one camera and it was going to follow Jerry around as he tried to figure out what to make his stand up out of. He was just going to, you know, be observing things or like Mm -hmm. how a comedian finds inspiration for his stand up. Right. And the NBC execs were like, okay, maybe. And they ended up instead. And of course, I think this is one of those famous, like Larry David got angry because the NBC execs were like, well, we could also do 
a half an hour three camera show like you could do like an actual pilot right and the way that jerry describes it in the documentary that i watched is it's this famous the nbc execs weren't like oh no we don't want to do your idea at all we actually want to do this it was more like they were just brainstorming right right And larry was like no it's a one camera it's an hour and a half that's it that's the show (laughs) <laughs> I like I like wanted to storm out, which apparently is a Larry, very Larry David thing to do. Okay, and they make George do that in season four. Of the it's show. true. Well, he's kind of a hothead, so. But eventually, what happens is they're given a half an hour to do this Seinfeld Chronicles special. It's given a terrible date to air, which is July fifth. It's in the middle of summer in nineteen eighty nine. It's that's which. I mean, July 5th, it's a day after the 4th of July. It's a terrible day to film it or or to air it, right? And a couple of the anecdotes to talk about with that. So so the thought is that they're basically dumping this thing. They're just dumping Mm -hmm. it because they're just like, yeah, we'll give it to you. Like, it's it's good exposure for you, like, whatever. But they have to make this show now. So, and of course, they talk about how neurotic Larry David was. Like, oh, God, I have to write an entire half an hour. How am I going to do this? Um... (laughs) So what they do is they realize they're at a birthday party for a mutual friend. And Larry forgot to bring a gift, which will come back into play later in our episode talking about season one. But Larry forgot to bring a gift. So he decides to write up some quick stand up and that'll be the gift. He'll do, do a routine for for mm-hmm. a birthday. But for some reason, he tells Jerry to read it or she tells jerry to read it maybe she told jerry to read it out loud because larry didn't want to read it okay like he wrote it for her like it was like you know like he wrote the stand-up down sure and they realize that larry's writing with jerry's style is really funny like apparently like (laughs) it it kills and it kind of makes sense because you have this very neurotic cynical larry david curb your enthusiasm style mixed with jerry's sarcastic but like naivete Mm -hmm. style and it just works so they realize that this is gonna that they can do this writing they can do this like style together jerry's gonna be in the show they have to cast two major people to be on this show with them one they decide they need to cast larry because they basically write the script they're writing like a larry david character named george costanza and they do auditions for it and one of the uh, actors that comes on board to audition is Jason Alexander. And someone at, uh, I can't remember if it was NBC or if it was at Castle Rock, but one of the execs knew him from stage plays because Jason Alexander was like a stage play guy at first. Okay. And so they have him audition. And he does the audition. He tries to do a Woody Allen impression because that's what mm-hmm. he thought the character was supposed to be. <laughs> which, close enough. But they give him the job right away and love sure. him. And the next one they do, they're trying to find, they write a character into the script to be Larry's neighbor. So Larry had a neighbor named Kenny Kramer. Oh my and God. they write it into the script to be Kessler, which Jerry eventually was like, no, it needs to be Kramer. It has to be Kramer, which I guess he was right. But for some reason, Jerry knew it needed to be Kramer. And Larry's neighbor was apparently this weird guy, this eccentric guy, very nice man, according to Jerry, and, but like sure. very eccentric and would come over to the house. Jerry even explains that they would be writing the script and he, and Kramer would like walk into the apartment, grab food and leave. Oh my God. <laughs> like exactly like the show. <laughs> That's amazing. And of course, Larry knew that Kenny Kramer would make a big deal about having to use his likeness. And according to Jerry, he did. He brought it up to NBC, like, I'm the real Kramer. Like, I I can be Kramer. I am Kramer. And they're like, you're not an actor. (laughs) So I guess they paid him off, which is is good. Good for Kenny Kramer. Yeah, really? Um, He's an iconic character is based off you. But to find this iconic character, they needed to find the right actor. And Jerry suggested Michael Richards. So I think Michael Richards came in to do it. And the story was he did the bit and they and he left and the NBC guys said well if you want funny there's funny (laughs) and it's i mean it's true and michael richards whatever you want to say about him as a person or whatever 
watching him in these documentaries, and obviously Kramer is one of the greatest characters of all time. I mean, he just is. Television oh, yeah. characters of all time. Oh, yeah. I mean, all four of them are, really. They decided to cast Michael Richards. And Michael Richards is so serious in all these be- behind-the-scenes stuff that I watch, Rach. It's kind of great, because he's just so... He talk- They're talking about the pilot, and Michael okay. Richards is like talking about george and he's like jason knew this like he's so serious he's just like jason was so good and he's like <laughs> jason knew this character so well he was so good at it and then he go- and then he talks about himself and he's like i didn't know exactly what to do yet i wasn't sure what to do i wasn't sure what reaction i was getting it's like right. and and i he knew nothing think- and he yeah. just went with it <laughs> i appreciate that he took it that seriously to play as wacky of a character as you'll ever see on television sure i did leave out Interestingly enough, so the studios that produced this were Sony Pictures and Castle Rock Entertainment. Castle Rock Entertainment, I didn't realize this until I watched this documentary. One of the guys at Castle Rock Entertainment, Rob Reiner, who is a very famous director of you know, Princess Bride and this is Spinal Tap. So interesting how all of these worlds kind of connect and weave together it's hollywood so of course that's how everything weaves and connects together Mm -hmm. um they're given this pilot and it airs and we'll talk about the reaction well let's talk about the reaction of the pilot now and then we'll talk about what happened after the pilot when we get to episode two because what happens is it airs yep they do test audiences with it and test audiences don't like it nope the notes that they're getting back are that it's to New York, which I don't know why it's to New Like, I get it. Like, there's New York in it, but to New York? Like, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I guess to folk. I don't know. And Is it, like, to... focal as in, like, how they're acting? Yeah. Like, like, they must they are just, like, from New York? Their... Or are they, like... like, their general attitude seems like it's New York, Okay, I guess. But, and... I mean, they are from New York. Right. It's in New York. It should be <laughs> New York. It should be New York. And to Jewish... Which I don't understand no? that at all. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> because never... his name is Seinfeld? But they and they never really talk about anything Jewish, never really comes up. But, no, but the idea doesn't. of the I'm show confused. is kind of intact in the way that it is, where it is like they are basically showing or trying to show where a comedian gets his imp- inspiration for his stand-up. And that's why there's cutbacks and the shows begin and end with stand-up about what the show's going on it was like a little thing that would happen in the show even sometimes where it was just that little thing is what he he kept for the comedian act so then on july 5th 1989 the pilot the seinfeld chronicles airs what a weird name (laughs) yeah well and i i think the first thing uh, the script doesn't even call it the seinfeld chronicles right Uh, the script called it something else it called it like jerry Seinfeld. the Jerry Something Seinfeld with Jerry. Show. Oh no, yeah. it called it it was called Stand Up. Oh, okay. It called Stand Up. It wasn't even called that at the time. So we'll get into what happened after the pilot aired, after we talk about the pilot. Rachel, anything else? Otherwise, let's get right into it. Let's talk about the Seinfeld problem. Oh, I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. We'll take a short break and then we'll uh, talk about Seinfeld. Laundry day is the only exciting day in the life of clothes. It is. No, think about it. The washing machine is the nightclub of clothes. You know, it's dark. There's bubbles happening. They're all kind of dancing around in there. Shirt grabs the underwear. Come on, babe. Let's go. You come by, you open up the lid, and they all... Socks are the most amazing article of clothing. They hate their lives. They're in the shoes with stinky feet, the boring drawers. The dryer is their only chance to escape, and they all know it. They do escape from the dryer. They plan it in the hamper the night before. Tomorrow, the dryer. I'm going. You wait here. The dryer door swings open. The sock is waiting up against the side wall. He hopes you don't see him. Then he goes down the road. Dun, 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 dun. They get buttons sewn on their face, join a puppet show. (laughs) So they're showing me on television the detergents for getting out blood stains. Is this a violent image to anybody? Blood stains? I mean, mean, come on, you got a t-shirt with blood stains all over it. Maybe laundry isn't your biggest problem right now. You gotta get the harpoon out of your chest first. We're back. 
And we are ready to begin our trek through Seinfeld, our Seinalcast. No. That's terrible. No. Our our podcast about nothing. I think somebody's got that one. Our, oh, yeah. We're going to watch all 180 episodes of Seinfeld at some point. We're going to watch them all, and we're going to do a show on each of them. And we're starting with the Seinfeld Chronicles. Seinfeld Shelf time. Life. Sign, sign Life. No. Shelf Field? Field? <laughs> <laughs> Just our Seinfeld episodes. Yeah, that's right. So we are beginning with the Seinfeld Chronicles, also known, or AKA, the pilot episode. It aired on July 5th, 1989. So as we talked about in the history episode or a little bit in the history episode, started out, they wanted it to just be a hour and a half long special. Jerry didn't think they had enough to get an hour and a half long special. So they went with a half an hour sitcom instead. They end up getting Jason Alexander, thanks to the casting director. They end up getting Michael Richards based on Jerry's thought of of him being funny. Mm -hmm. And the show that became an idea... Because Jerry and Larry were at a Korean grocer making fun of some of the food. And Larry said, this should be the show. Comes to I was going to say, I thought you were about to say a joke there. Jerry and Larry went to get some Korean food. I'm waiting for the punchline. <laughs> well, I guess the, uh, the punchline is the entire show. Oh, so nice. with that's all, all 180 episodes is the punchline. This should be the show. This should be the show, Jerry. We could do this. Just, just, just people talking. It's all the show is. Oh, no. <laughs> so they were given a spot for NBC. Uh, and July 5th, as we talked about, a terrible date. But let's dive into it. Let's start talking about what they came up with. They said it was easy to write for them. They en- enjoyed writing together. So let's start. As we mentioned, it starts with a totally different theme song. This thing is... I'm so glad that they changed the theme song. Oh, it's so it's glad. It's not good. No. It's so 80s, and it just does not convey what should be the Seinfeld theme. And it just doesn't feel right, you know? And now, if you're watching it not on the DVDs, you might not hear this, because they have two versions of it on the DVD, and one has the right theme. Mm-hmm. And that really seems like it's the only difference. Yeah, it did. It really did. Because I, I went through a little bit through the different pilots, and I was just like, is it just the theme song and the between transitions and everything? Or what's the difference here? So it starts as all of the early episodes of Seinfeld starts with Jerry doing stand-up. And he's doing some stand-up. A little bit different. It's a, it's a completely black background. You get the name of it. It says the Seinfeld Chronicles. And then it goes through the name of the, of the cast, which is weird, too, because Seinfeld just doesn't do that on a typical basis. Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit different, too. So clearly, like, it's a pilot. They haven't quite figured out what they're doing yet. It, it looks a little more traditional than Seinfeld ends up looking. Jason Alexander gets the and. The and Jason Alexander. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> Very important. Yeah. <laughs> And the stand-up is about getting out of the house, about, you know, trying to get out, do something outside, or go do something out of the house. Yeah, go out. Go out. Do something. Don't, well, you can, but make sure to take uh, your Shelf Life episodes with you. And your Shelf Life mask for that <laughs> mask mandate for wherever you are. Well, yeah. As of the time of this recording... <laughs> I really by, hope the by the time, time of this then... recording, by the time people are listening to this, it's probably still going to be a mask mandate. <laughs> it's, it's a sad commentary. There's episodes <laughs> in this season where we're talking about, yeah, we're you know at the tail end, and, and but whatever. And we end up in our first scene, and the first scene includes Jerry and George. They're at a diner. It is not Monks. It is a different diner, and they're both sitting at a table that it's very colorful. That was the thing I thought about this entire episode. It's so bright. Like, there's a lot of is that 80s it is? colors. Yeah. I think I see what you mean. And I don't know if that's just a motif. I mean, granted, the next four episodes would air a year later, but I, I just felt like it was so 80s in that it was like, everything is kind of bright. Yeah. Their shirts are bright. This diner has this turquoise blue in the background. Sure. 
and there's a lot of extras too but i and like how we kind of said it has the feeling of a stage play Mm -hmm. it really does or you know an snl skit or whatever and the show begins with the conversation and the first line is also the last line of the series or, or one of the last lines of the series i should say and that is that Jerry tells George that the button is in the worst possible spot. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, that's funny. I didn't even realize it. Now it makes sense. It's yeah, that's why, that's why it comes back at the end. But yes, the button is in the worst possible spot. That's the first observation made. It, it ruins the whole shirt. And they are... Oh, this diner is called Pete's Diner. Yeah, this is a different diner. I wrote it down. It's Pete's Diner. I thought that George seemed more snappy in this episode. He I mean, did. he seems more snappy in general, but more witty than he really ends up being. Right. Smarter. Well, he is witty in the rest of it. I think it's just the the impact of how he's saying it. Because in this, he's a New Yorker. He sounds like a New Yorker way more than I think in the other episodes. Yes, he, he definitely has a lot more of a New Yorker accent. Yeah, that strong accent. Jerry, the signals, Jerry. Yeah, it is a little bit more than that. Might have been a <laughs> Jewish New York I accent, was going to but... say, you kind of went a little like, how's your mother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that, yeah, okay. He still does seem neurotic. He still is paranoid about stuff, as we'll get into in a sec. And Jerry mentions that a woman might be coming in. It's a woman that he met while he was doing a show in Lansing, Michigan. She teaches political science there. Mm -hmm. And Jerry reveals that she's coming in for a seminar and that she told Jerry, maybe we'll get together. And this prompts George to go, oh, whoa, whoa. I don't like this. Maybe. Maybe we'll get together. (laughs) Maybe. So they they proceed to kind of have a debate about whether or not that maybe was really an invitation that the two of them would get together right. and do something or not. They truly pick apart the word usage here. Well, nothing happened, you know, but it was great. Well, nothing happened, but it was great. Well, this is yeah. great. Yeah. So, you know, she called and said she wants to go out with you tomorrow night. God bless. <laughs> Devil you. <laughs> yeah. Well, not exactly. I mean, she said, you know, she called this morning and said she had to come in for a seminar and maybe we'd get together. So, you know. Oh, oh, oh. Had to? Yeah. Had to come in? Yeah. But... Had to come in? Yeah, and but maybe we'll get together? Had to and maybe? Yeah. No. No. No, I hate to tell you this. You're not going to see this woman. What? Are you serious? Why, why did she call? What do I know? Maybe, you know, maybe she wanted to be polite. To be polite? You are insane. All right, all right. I didn't want to tell you this. You want to know why she called? Yes. You're a backup. You're a second line, a just in case, a B plan, a contingency. (laughs) Oh, I get it. This is about the button. (laughs) George thinks that he's a, you're a backup. You're a contingency plan. So, Rachel, we have the distinguished honor, unlike most podcasts, of having a male and female perspective on this. Uh, that's true, yeah. So <laughs> there's, there we do have the opportunity here. Okay, and George does the same thing to the waitress <laughs> in the episode. That's true. So George has the waitress come over, Claire. Mm-hmm. Claire is this waitress. It's a character that is only in the pilot, played by Lee, what's, what's the actress's name? Lee Garlington plays the actress. I think she's she's a good character. She's a good compliment to George's neuroses. She is. Like yeah, you can the way tell she if, jabs at him a little bit. Yeah, like if they would have kept her around, she would have jabbed it. George would be getting upset a lot more. Yeah. George's yeah. getting upset. <laughs> We're going to I mean, if you're listening to this, you listen to the Simpsons episode too. The references will all be circular. Just a little on bit. On shelf life. Just a little we're, bit. Well, we got sucked into the Twilight Zone, so the timing, we're, we don't know what year it is. We're all just kind of here. We're in yeah, that's true. pop culture at I this mean, point. I mean, absolutely. It happened. We didn't mean for it to happen, but yeah. it happened. Don't tell me it didn't happen. I saw it happen. <laughs> so Jerry, or George, asked the waitress to come over and says, 
Claire, let me ask you something. And then he does the maybe. And the waitress agrees with George that the that this woman has no intention of seeing him. So, Rachel, I will posit to you. Do, if you are now you're you're a married woman, but yeah. if but if in general, from yes. the female perspective, if you said maybe we'll get together. What does that indicate to you? I do agree with the waitress yeah. and and George that it is she's being polite. She's saying, "Oh, you know, I'll be in town and maybe we'll get together." You know, as like a, "Oh, well, if if there's time, if you know, like everything falls right, maybe we'll we'll see each other." If she would have said, "We'll have to get together. We could do this," mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. would indicate there's a plan now. Right. This maybe doesn't set a plan. <laughs> well, and so I, that's I, where I, my thoughts go with this one. I'm, I'm definitely more George Costanza than not. So I would say I, I, we'll get into signals and how terrible I am at picking up signals. But, I mean, as far as we can for a brother-sister podcast. But I would agree, too. Saying maybe we'll get together, it is kind of like a being play. Oh, well, maybe we'll get together. Like, right. There's, like, nothing, oh, yeah. there's nothing set in stone. Right. I won't go as far as George and say it's a contingency plan. Yeah, no, that's I, I, no, I wouldn't drop it down to there. Yeah, I don't think that he's a backup if something doesn't work out. I think it's more if there's time. Right. She'll see him. Right. But if not, it's uh, not really there. Yeah. It's not a big deal if we don't see each other. But clearly, Jerry is hoping that there is some sort of romance between. Spark. Yes. Between him and and this lady. The good little bit here, too, is George asking for decaf. Yes. I did like this. And the waitress being like, decaf right, regular left, or it might be reversed. Regular was right, decaf left. Regular right. See, that's how we left. Yeah. <laughs> it's very taxing. <laughs> uh, but then she kind of messes with him because she tells right at the end of their, that, like when they're paying. Right. That like, oh, I gave, I gave oh, him don't a worry. little regular. Yeah, it was, oh, don't worry. I gave him a little regular or uh, caffeine. So he'll be picked. He'll you have a little pick me up in no time. Right. And then he spazzes. <laughs> yeah, he spazzes. And one of the charming things, I think it's charming throughout the entirety of Seinfeld is Jerry in particular every so often kind of breaks because he's not a real actor. So you can tell he's, he's breaking here. Like if the scene kept going for another second, he'd start laughing. He smiles. Yeah. He had a big smile on his face. Uh, Just based on what George is, or, you know, Jason is doing here. So he makes him go to the laundromat with him. And so now we get another scene and this entire show, at least the first episode here, is just people talking. That's the whole idea of it, right? So every time I'm going to say, and then this happens, or so this happens, we're really just going to another setting with people talking, and that's the plot advancing. Yep. Which, I mean, I don't, there's not a lot of shows that do that now. Like, they just wouldn't have faith in the audience. And they didn't have faith in the audience back then. That's why it made it so radical and different. Right. People nowadays, I don't know if their attention can be held that long. No, because, I mean, there's definitely, I remember this being quite slow, and it's really not as slow as I remembered it being, but it is slow in the idea that it is just a bunch of It's a stage play. It's a a, a stage play. It's a, um, it feels like it's an improv show, with a bunch of people just up there and all just kind of, like, working with each other to get the scene to come out funny right which of course it isn't at all no it's all very rich and i'm not saying it's poorly done i'm just saying it feels like a group of actors yeah, playing, playing off, off each, each other, other. Yeah. yeah i mean it is called one of the best written shows of all time now so they're at this laundromat they're basically sitting there people watching i don't know if that term was a term in 1989 but they basically are people watching were they like they have a little bit about a guy who's being very particular about his oh yeah they were watching the guy with all of the different laundry supplies yeah, he had like he had like a ton of laundry supplies which seems like something jerry would do like, yeah i was I kind of like... surprised he didn't have all of the laundry yeah. supplies especially like later seasons jerry would have had a different bottle for every shirt no you have to put the starch on the white shirt and then you have to put this on the cotton and like right so it's interesting that that's the observation. But it has nothing to do with the plot. No. Like, it's just, and, and it's clearly in there because it's, this is a... It's life. It's life. You're not always talking about the plot. 
sometimes you're just talking about observations that you're seeing around you. Right. And that, I think, is also part of the whole idea of a show where you're watching a comedian get his ideas because you're just watching him watch stuff, basically. Yeah. That's kind of the show. No, it makes sense. Because he has to be observant in order to find the jokes he wants. Right. So Jerry brings it up again. Uh, well, about... well, well, you didn't, you forgot to say that George is over there pacing because he doesn't want to be there at <laughs> all. <laughs> I've been that guy. I think everybody has. You tag along with a friend so that... Because they don't want to be alone. They don't want to be alone. But it's a very boring activity. So you're just waiting for it to get done. Yeah. And... You sit there and you're like, pace. I think George even says, I gotta tell you, this is the most bored I've ever yes. been in my life or something <laughs> like that. But, George, but yeah, go ahead. Jerry, now he brings back up the, the plot. Yeah, they go back to Laura, this woman that is coming into town. Uh, George argues here that he didn't pick up on the signals. It's all about signals, Jerry. <laughs> signals. He goes into further detail on what he means. He meaning George about how he's missing these Jerry's missing these signals that being she's coming in on a Saturday but she didn't leave a hotel or mm-hmm. a number to reach her at right and then they don't know would they be going to a dinner because you would need to get a reservation because right. it's not covid you need and, to make a plan yeah there's no plan here right and Jerry starts to believe George because that's true there was no detail Mm -hmm. left for him so it does kind of make sense that there's no there's that she doesn't really have a plan that it is just like oh maybe we'll get together and then we'll figure out what to do from there yeah i don't think that jerry wants to totally abandon the idea but i think he thinks that george is right george is making some good points george is pretty observational here yeah weirdly (laughs) well it is the pilot (laughs) sure no it makes sense I think if you're that as neurotic as George is, yeah, you, you probably you you read into things probably more than you should. So I think this is him getting lucky and being right about the signals. <laughs> but I feel like more well, most he, of the time he's completely he wrong about it. the next the next conversation they have okay, about yeah, signals. Yeah. He's completely wrong. This is true because he reads into it too much. Right. He doesn't put all of the steps together. He puts the most. Just these few things, yeah. So then we get another conversation while they're at the laundromat about something that has nothing to do with the plot. George asks him to go check the laundry, and we get a discussion that you can't be over dry, because George is like, well, you're going to over dry them. And Jerry's like, you can't over dry, you can't over wet. Something's either dry or it's wet. And he's like, you're dead, you're dead. You can't over dye, you can't over dry. And it clearly was them trying to write like a writer. Like it it felt like a stand up or like if you and I were to write a screenplay or something, we'd be like, you gotta have something clever in there. Yeah. Well, I thought was funny was that the entire laundromat stops doing what they're doing and starts listening to Jerry as he's talking about you can't over die. And immediately I'll like kind of look up and they're like, what is he talking about? Yeah. Well, it's, I thought it was supposed to be more like it's a comedian doing a bit and gathering an audience by just doing his shtick. Sure. Kind of a thing. I That's don't know. I they looked like. a little like, this is weird in the background to me. I liked that George then goes and he sneakily opens the door to the yeah, to it's the like, dryer like, so like oh, it it's done. Well, they're done. <laughs> yeah. After this, we get one of. So I remember this stand up fondly. I don't remember why I know this stand up. Well, I do, and I will explain it. I will explain it now. I don't so know why, a... but I do. <laughs> we get we... well. I was gonna say I don't really know, but I kind of know. I just don't know why I remember it fondly from this point so it's a stand-up about laundry day okay and i still love the bloodstains gag <gasps> i remember this. this yes this one i i also remember this one actually really like, well i don't know why it's just like one of my favorite bits that he does about if you have to get bloodstains out of a shirt maybe you have a bigger <laughs> problem than doing your laundry <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, but I, like I said, I re- I've read a couple of Seinfeld books. And in one of the times I read a Seinfeld book, it was mm-hmm. for freshman year English class. Because you had to read a biography about somebody. And I picked Jerry, a Jerry Seinfeld biography. Of course. 
and I thought it would be clever because I'm just as I'm just as much a ham then as I am now. I've always <laughs> been a, a ham. I thought I'll do a stand up routine and fit the book report within the stand up routine. I remember you doing this. So like I would give some information about the biography about Jerry, and then I would do a bit very much like Seinfeld, kind of. But I remember doing this laundry bit. Not this blood stain part, but I remember doing the part about the socks sticking to the walls. And because the book that I read said that it was like one of his first bits that he wrote was about laundry. Mm -hmm. So this one, I guess, always sticks with me or even stuck with me back then of just like being one of my favorite bits he does. But anyway, yes, I've always been doing these hammy bits about Seinfeld. Did you get Uh, a good grade? I don't, I have, I couldn't tell you if I had a good, I got, I, mean, you I got brought laughs. this up. I feel like we had to know. <laughs> I got laughs. I got a lot of laughs. Yeah, that's what matters. I'll take uh, it. My future college roommate at the time decided to enhance the experience by turning up the projector light on so that it looked like I had a spotlight on me. It's amazing. <laughs> And I think, I mean, Rachel, you could imagine him doing it. Absolutely. Like, wait, wait, wait. Like, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And maybe laughing like Kramer, too. Or that or, or that one executive producer that you can hear his laugh in yes. the laugh track over there. Like, <laughs> that guy's laugh. Yeah, there you go. So we go back to Jerry's apartment, and this is the first time we see Jerry's apartment. And it looks weird. It does look a little weird. It does. (laughs) The the cabinets in the kitchen. Yeah. (laughs) It's not all quite there. There's like weirder furniture. Mm -hmm. The bed, you can't figure out where the bedroom's at. There's just some stuff not quite right about this place. Right. But it's our first look in it. And the setup is still the same. The Mm -hmm. setup looks right. Yeah. The weirdest part about it is he has this window off to the like by where like his computer ends up sitting Mm -hmm. like his little office area there's this big window as opposed to the little window that we get used to they put yeah 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 yeah. so he has more of a view of the city than he ends up having and in this crappy little apartment like it's it's not the best apartment i would maybe it's an average apartment i really don't know it's new york (laughs) so jerry in this is representing a pretty decently you know like a like a popular comedian okay okay but he's not supposed to be like the you know highfalutin comedian in this sure so this probably makes sense and when we get to the robbery you find out that he can afford more but he chooses not to sure and even in the books that i've read about jerry and about the making of seinfeld and stuff that's something that i think him and larry probably share in common like he's he is a lot more conservative with his money on how he would spend it so it makes sense okay and he takes it's a great little character moment to set up what like who jerry is because he's got a bowl of cereal and he's taped the mets game and it's one in the morning right because he was doing he was at a just got back yeah yeah so he's going to watch this Mets game and eat a bowl of cereal. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> it's very Jerry Seinfeld. Yes. The and... person, not the character. Actually, <laughs> well, both. Because <both. laughs> he is playing himself. He's playing True. an enhanced version of himself. He's not as mean yet. Or, like, you know, uh, what, he, what, what he becomes as the character. I don't, I don't, I don't know if you can call them mean. They're just terrible people. They're, they're aloof. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're just aloof. Yeah. Somebody calls him, which I don't know who would call at this time of night either, when we find out it's one in the morning. Well, yeah, but... because let me think about it. It's like he has to have an answering machine. He has to have a tape answering machine if they're going to call it like one in the morning. And he's not going to pick up. Right. Otherwise, they don't have caller ID. It's just a phone. <laughs> Well, and he I gotta to explain tape. this to our younger audience. That's right. For our younger audience, he also, he didn't DVR it. He had to get a VH, a blank VHS tape, <laughs> put it into the VCR, and then press, and set up a timer yep. to record it, which is something that we did as kids. I, I mean, I've got all oh, this yeah. crap on VHS Absolutely. at mom and dad's. I was that kid. That <laughs> I didn't realize that YouTube and DVDs were going to exist, so I needed to tape all of them so that I could own the collection before you know we had the opportunity to do this this right and i do love that he answers the phone and he goes if you know what happened in the mess game don't tell me i haven't watched it yet like he like immediately anyone to spoil it and 
it turns out to be a wrong number, which I guess makes, like, that's why somebody was calling him at one in the morning. Right. But he hangs up, and we get the first appearance of Cosmo Kramer. Woo! Also known... Yeah! <laughs> also known as Kessler. So the first name that they had for Kramer was Kessler. Because I don't they didn't like want it. Kenny Kramer to be Kramer, because they thought he'd cause a fuss. Right. And Jerry was like, it's got to be Kramer. We've got to change it to Kramer. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think that they said his name at all in this show, in this episode. I've seen in some parts, maybe Jerry says Kessler under his breath. Okay. But uh, I've seen notes on that on the internet, but I didn't think that we ever hear his name is Kessler. So I think it's always been Kramer. Well, Kramer's the last name. Yeah, Are you saying Kessler, Kessler was the Kessler last name? Kessler would have been the last name, yeah. Um, and it just does, it doesn't no. work. Kramer works so much better. Oh, absolutely. And as I described to you, Rachel, offline, mm -hmm. so his hair isn't poofy, and then... His he, attitude's weird. Well, he's a lot more, like, lackadaisical. Yeah. And Michael Richards Talk about says, aloof. Michael Richards says in some behind-the-scenes stuff that's on the DVD, he's like, I didn't quite have the character yet. He was like, I w wasn't sure exactly what I was doing. He was like, he thought that Jason was great and that he had the George character already solidified, mm -hmm. but he wasn't sure if he had his character down yet. So maybe that's why you think he isn't quite there yet. Right. And he's not. I mean, he's, he's more laid back. Sure. Yeah. He seems a little out of it. Without being, yeah. like, weird. No, he does. He's You're just, right. like, You're out right. of it. Yeah, he does seem a little out of it. That's a good way to put it. But he immediately gives away the, Oh, the Mets blew it tonight! <laughs> right. He immediately ruins it for Jerry. Uh, yes. And then, as I told you offline, Rachel, I laughed, and then you laughed because I did it to you. Yes. Because he just... Jerry's all upset at him because he gave the game away. And then he just takes two slices of bread out of his pocket <laughs> and goes, do you have any meat? Well, he looks like, he looks so tired. He's in a bathrobe, you know? It's not even like a pocket. It's a pocket of a bathrobe. He takes two slices of bread. Do you have any meat? <laughs> <laughs> it's so ridiculous. It's the perfect way to introduce this character and i'm assuming it's in the script but half of me wants to say that he just came with bread in his pocket and <laughs> did it it feels like it could have been like a, i'm just gonna do it and see what happens type of thing <laughs> and it worked so they just went with it yeah no yeah you up yeah yeah people do move <laughs> have you ever seen the big trucks out on the street <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Boy, the Mets blew it tonight, huh? Oh, what are you doing? Kessler, it's a tape. I taped the game. It's one o'clock in the morning. I avoided human contact all night to watch this. Hey, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I thought you knew. I... You got any meat? Meat? I, I don't know. Go hunt. <laughs> and he really fishes in this fridge to get some meat too jerry has a bunch of roast beef in the fridge right so he gets this big ass sandwich oh yeah <laughs> speaking of the script that you bring it up larry david says to this day he can't watch the pilot without cringing because so much of the script got changed by oh. nbc or or so he says he thinks a third of it got changed so who knows what that means? Like, maybe they had to quicken the pace a little bit, because I bet Larry David had a lot more talky stuff in it, sure. and they thought it was too slow or something. But that is, you know, who what, what's in the script and what's not kind of depends on who you ask, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And we get the line from Jerry that Kramer hasn't left the building in 10 years. And... You see that in the first several episodes of Seinfeld. You only ever see Kramer in Jerry's apartment. You don't see him outside of the apartment. And I, I don't know if that was supposed to be the quirky, the quirky, I was going to say quirky quirk. The quirky shut-in. 
Yeah, like he's the quirky shut-in neighbor, which Jerry was worried about at first because he thought that it was too cliche, but it just works for Kramer. No, it, it does. Like, he should be. That is what he is. Or he's just a figment of Jerry's imagination and he doesn't really exist to anybody else except for Jerry. Oh, it's just my neighbor, but he's really just talking to himself this whole time. <laughs> Because does anybody else interact with Kramer during this episode? Uh, George does. Okay. okay. Well, George kind of does. We'll get to that. But that would have been an interesting take if if Kramer is a figment of Jerry's imagination. No, that might be too far. But yeah. (laughs) I mean, you go ahead and you write that college essay on that, folks. And let's see (laughs) if you can make that a fan theory. Yeah, dissect it a little bit for me. Kramer comes and he just sits down next to Jerry with this big sandwich and just starts trifling through a magazine. And he cuts out a page. Oh my god. It's all set up to show that Kramer is a mooch. He doesn't have a social boundaries. Oh, he has and no a lot, boundaries. Yeah. A lot of this show is about social boundaries, too. A lot of Seinfeld is. That's so, true. That is a good theme to give it. Is that like social boundaries? Absolutely. Social boundaries, social cues. And Kramer represents the lack of, like the total absence of social cues. To somebody who has a lot of boundaries set up. Like like, like Jerry. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of have like the yin and yang of social boundaries here. So Kramer offers because Kramer's like, I thought I wasn't supposed to come over because Jerry must have told him he was going to have a girl. Sure. And, and since Kramer likes to just come over. <laughs> right, yeah. So, I mean, it's it's fair that he just, he, you know, he told him, like, oh, yeah, you can't pop in. And Jerry's like, no, it's fine. I read the signals wrong. And, and, and Kramer, this part's Kramer. Like, the face Michael Richards gives here where he's like, you better believe it. You want me to talk to her? <laughs> I know. No, I can be very persuasive. You know that I was almost... A lawyer? (laughs) Back close, huh? You better believe it. That whole little bit was very Oh, yeah. Just in the way that he moves his... He uses his facial expressions. Yeah, he uses the features a lot, which is, I think, why Kramer is probably one of my favorite characters. (laughs) (laughs) So while they're sitting there, the girl actually calls. Yes. Which, talk about taking a risk, because we already know it's late, Right. And she's calling Jerry. now. Well, I guess she does say, like, did I wake you up? And Jerry's like, no, I'm up at this time all the time. Right. So I guess, I guess she Which she did... may have known because she knows he's a comedian. That's true. That's true. I Would you, if you don't have comedian friends, though, would you, like, put that two and two together like that? I don't know if I would necessarily think that someone's up. I mean, I nowadays, true, you would just, yeah. you'd send them a text message. Right. So it's not like it would be a big deal. You just send them a text. They'd see it the next day. Right. Or they'd answer at one in the morning when they're awake because they just got home from a club. (laughs) (laughs) Laura says that she's looking for a place to stay Mm -hmm. and can they pick her up at the airport? So he says, yeah, they can. And, And then we get our commercial break and we come back to the exterior. The exterior, not quite the Seinfeld apartment yet. It's not the right exterior. Right. So we're at some weird place. We're in bizarro land. And it's George and Jerry hauling up a bed because he's trying to bring in an extra bed for her to sleep in. Yeah, but don't think like an actual bed. Just think of like a roll-up mattress because it's just a roll. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah. It was literally just a roll-up thick thing to lay on. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) I thought, I guess I wasn't quite paying attention. So it was more like a sleeping, like a heavy sleeping bag. Pretty much. I mean, like, um... Like, you know those pads they have at the gym or something that you can yeah. roll out? Think that, but big. Like, a bed-sized. <laughs> well, like maybe he thick, was going like to sleep. Like a thick cushion, but you can roll it up. Yeah. Do you think he was going to sleep on that and then let her have his bed? It's a good question. I don't I mean, know. <laughs> that would be me. If, if yeah, I'm in Jerry's Jerry. shoes... And I'm giving her the option. Why even give her the option? I don't know. She could sleep on the couch. The couch, I think, would be more comfortable. You've watched the episode more recently than me, so I'll take your word for it. You're right. It it is odd looking. We should just play that in the background and we'll just do the lines. (laughs) (laughs) We'll just do, we'll read the script for you. 
as we do this. Okay, so it is like a rolled up mattress thing. George is wearing a bowling shirt and like this little <laughs> newsy hat. It's a yeah, very yeah, odd a look for hat. George. Yeah. It doesn't fit George. It's a very no. strange look. So then George starts doing this. This is the signal, Jerry. The signals of not wanting him to give her an option of using the bed. Here's one thing that yeah. does that does get mentioned before we go on to what you wanted to talk about here. Jerry says a joke about how his dad would, would be hauling the thing up with a cigarette sticking yes. out of his mouth. I do not see Maury Seinfeld smoking. Never. Not the original one or the normal one. No, I don't see I him can't ever smoking. see it. So I don't know who put that. I don't even see Jerry's dad in real life smoking. Like maybe he was a smoker. It makes sense because Jerry's dad would have been like born in the 30s or 40s or whatever. But, right. So maybe it makes sense. Maybe, but I just, you look at the actors who are portraying the yeah, dad. I don't like, see Morty smoking. No, not a cigarette at least. Maybe a cigar? Yeah, maybe. When, but, he, when, I, when he was selling raincoats. Yeah, you gotta do the cigars, the Cubans. So, so go ahead and say what you were gonna. <laughs> do you know what I was going to say? I was gonna do a side for a second and be like, oh, no, where go the hell ahead. did this dog come from? <laughs> That's why I figured. <laughs> Like, That's I don't, I okay, figured. the next thing that happens is this weird dog comes in, and I, I don't know where this dog comes from. It's never explained. There's just a dog that Kramer has. So, I know the back. story. I know the story here because I've watched and listened to all the background shit. Oh, yeah, please tell me, because I need to know now. So, originally, Jerry has a bit about dogs in his stand-up. Some bit about dogs in his stand-up routine. Sure. And they wanted to include it in the pilot. So they had Kramer have a dog just for this scene, just to jump on George, just for the bit of stand-up that they were going to cut away to. Right. And they ultimately determined that it had nothing to do with the show. Like, it, it was slowing down the pace of the plot. Yeah. So they cut it, cut the stand-up part, but they are, had the dog there still. They just left the dog in. So this is the only episode where Kramer has a golden retriever. It's just so random. I kind of like the idea of Kramer having a golden retriever. Well, but... he, he himself is a golden retriever. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> it's kind of true, yes. <laughs> but he never ends up having a dog oh, ever I, again. I, why, though? I do think that Kramer would have a dog. It does make it sense makes for sense. him to have a dog. Yeah, it does fit. And then the dog runs into the bathroom. He's like, he's going to get a drink. He's so casual about the, having the dog, too. Right. So uh, Kramer agrees. Like, why even give her an option to sleep in the other bed? Yeah. Like, if she's coming over here, she's sleeping with you. And this is where we get the George line that comes back later in Seinfeld, which is, you always go against your instincts in this situation. Always go against your instincts. Yeah. Which ends up being an episode. Always go against your instincts. Yeah, that ends up being an episode. It's it's very weird advice to To go go against against your your instincts. instincts. Like, most of the time people would say to go with your instincts. And he's like, no, don't go with your instincts. But George is super neurotic. So he thinks his, his instincts are always wrong. Yeah. I don't know. That man is so, like, <laughs> confusing in and of himself. I mean, I, I get, so, like, I am bad at picking up signals, too, I think. Like, if you were to ask me in my lifetime, I don't know if anyone has ever flirted with me at all. Like, I just <laughs> don't know. Uh. I, like, how, how am I supposed to know? And maybe one day, maybe there'll be another There's episode. Little tells. That, well, maybe there'll be another episode because I, I remember a famous situation that was very Seinfeldian. And if we get my ex roommate on the show one day, he's one of our Seinfeld experts, I would say. Yeah. There is a story about me in college where I was very much missing the signals, apparently, according to him, if he remembers that story. But I would say, I, I just, I don't know. How are you supposed to know? Well, you're a female, so you would say you. there's little clues that you're supposed little to pick clues, up Little clues, yeah. Women don't want to... Well, okay, some women are very obvious because they're confident about it. Most women like to be subtle. So folks at home, folks out there, gr- women out there, if you see me on the street or on your, <laughs> or your, your local Tinder... Just be obvious about it because I'm too stupid to figure out what you're trying to do. And then you'll look confident and then I'll be like, look at this. Look at this woman. Yeah, he likes confidence. So, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I do. <laughs> we, we've all, we'll get into the fact that the four horsewomen 
and Katniss and all oh. of the all of the <laughs> all of the women that I think are you know my role models <laughs> compared to others. But anyway, so anyway, where are we here? Oh, so. Jerry goes into the bathroom to get ready to go to a stand-up show, which is weird because he's in there with the dog. I guess the dog went into <laughs> no, the dog Jerry's left. bedroom. The dog left. <laughs> he's like in Jerry's bedroom because the dog comes back to sit on the couch with Kramer when oh, they yeah. leave at the end of the scene. Oh, yeah, that's weird. I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't know. I guess he is in there with him. This is normal. This is this what is happens. This is normal. This is like, everyday they, life. <laughs> yeah. So Kramer is standing there with George, and you can tell George is not comfortable with Kramer. So they're just standing there awkwardly, and Kramer's like, so how's the real estate business? And and he tells George to keep him up to date on any commercial real estate. Like, yeah. he's going to buy an office. It's so weird. <laughs> yeah, what? It, well... He always, okay, we'll learn this later about Kramer, but he does always have, he always has entrepreneurial dreams and aspirations and ideas (laughs) and (laughs) crazy ideas, typically. So I could see why he would want an office because, you know, one day he's going to get one of those. He's got Kramer, he's got Kramer Industries. Yeah. (laughs) Jerry finally comes out. And they head off to the club. I thought it was weird that George is so concerned about getting Jerry to the club. He's like, come on, come on, you're on in 45 minutes or whatever he says. So we cut to some stand-up. And this one is about how girl, women need, I think he's girls or women need stuff that men just don't need. And he specifically talks about cotton cotton balls. Yeah, where did cotton balls come up in this scene? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so there's this big thing about cotton balls in his act. Which is for taking off makeup, right? That's why I, I use it for my balls. nails when I do nail polish I or nail polish. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Or you have to like swab something, you know. Yeah, but to Jerry's <laughs> point, even if I lived with a woman, I'd be like, I have no idea. Why do you need these cotton balls? Like it doesn't. It is totally doesn't make any sense. He's not wearing his jacket, which was very disturbing to me. Oh, that is kind of weird. He always has like a blazer. Like, yeah, sports but it, jacket just on. for this stand up, this is the only stand up and he doesn't have his jacket on. It was very peculiar. I didn't like it. It was disturbing. I couldn't it stand was it. Very, it was very I had to turn it off. He got the shit so from it. We go to the airport and they talk about it. Jerry's worried again and they decide that they're going to have to figure out what she wants based on the greeting that she gives when she arrives. So then they decide to do these various greetings and they talk about the hand over hand. Right. Handshake. And they talk about, well, what if it's a hug? And they're like, well, what if it's the butt out hug? Right. Where your you arms, really your to shoulders touch are touching. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, I thought that this is pretty accurate. I feel I like think this that, is something I would talk about. Yeah. This is definitely something that I think about when I'm meeting anyone. Oh, like yeah. nowadays, post- March 2020, I will try my damnedest to not shake anybody's hand. Correct. So it's... But when you're meeting somebody, like, without that thought in mind, there's some people that are huggers, and they'll go for it. You don't even know this person, but they hug you. You know hug... Like, I don't know anybody oh, I've that will met hug me if I don't know them. I've met huggers. I don't, I don't like a hugger. <laughs> not at the office or anything, because... <laughs> But on, like, more social occasions, you know. I feel like people... Friends of a friend I, well, will be like, hi! I think, and then, like, give you a hug. And you're just like, I didn't really want see, that, but, but cool. Yeah, I, I could see <laughs> you having to deal with that. I think I give off a cringy enough face that people... It's that Jerry face of that, like, don't come near me, that people won't hug me oh, right geez. away. Oh, well, I guess I, that makes it that I don't have a resting bitch face. Good thing. Good to know. That's good true. To know. Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got a hug goodbye the other day. Oh, which a hug man. goodbye from That's a good, a good like thing too, from good, good friends. We went out to a place and it was the three of us, two of my female friends that will be on the show at some point. Oh yeah. We've got episodes lined they up for them to. specifically. And they'd hug uh, me. If I met them, they'd hug me. Yeah, because the one is definitely a hugger <laughs> and then the other one kind of hugs because the one hugs and they know exactly who I'm talking about now and they're saying, "Oh my god," as as I, we say that. I'm just saying. <laughs> But I, I know that, that that if I ever meet them, we have to write this down, people. We will let you know when I finally get to meet them in person. They're gonna hug me. But what, is it a butt? <laughs> but is it a butt out? Do you think it's no. a butt out hug? Nah. It's a, is it a one a shoulder? Because I, hug. if it's a friend, even if it's one of my best friends ever, unless we know we're You're not gonna about see the each dude other. Hug that like that side hug. 
No, not even. A, no, not a side hug. Because like a side hug is more like, eh, come here, come here. <laughs> That's the side hug. No, me and my my good, unless we're not gonna, if we're not gonna see each other for a while, we'll do the hug. We'll do the clap the back. Yeah, the clap the back, the big smack, yeah. and then. Yeah, that hug. Otherwise, the manly like, hug, yeah. if you will. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta try to you gotta try to burp that baby. <laughs> I, that's what I call it, the burp the baby hug. Because oh, you really want to, you got to smack that upper back. Otherwise, it's like a good, you know, one one arm. So so you, you both take your right arm or your left arm, you choose, and you do a one arm over the back. Oh, yeah, you that, both, especially you if you still, have like a drink, you do that, yeah. Yeah, you still kind of touch, <laughs> you, your chest still touch, but you're not, you're not in a full embrace. Okay, okay. No, I, I would say full embrace. That's a, when... A lot of the time, at least, okay, from speaking from my experience, women hugs, okay, it's usually a full hug. Yeah, full hug. and uh, a hand over hand type thing. I oh, don't yeah, where know. it's like that, mm, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, now the fist bump is probably the more appropriate. I just do like a good, like a, like a head nod. Oh yeah, the head nod. That's just like a, that's a classic. You do that to anybody you like make eye contact with. You just like, kind of go, now, yeah. Nowadays, I think the rest of my <laughs> life, I'm going to try to just do a head nod. Especially like if somebody at work that is new or is higher up than you and they go in for the handshake, it's just like, okay, let me just go get the hand sanitizer. Yeah, that you feel rude, but you're just like, I'm just going to pour that on right away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you've been. <laughs> right, listen, listen, listen. Don't get worked up because you're going to know the whole story the minute she steps off the plane. Really? How? Because it's all in the greeting. Uh-huh. All right. If she puts the bags down before she greets you, that's a good sign. Right. You know, anything in the, in the lip area is good. Lip area. You know, a hug, definitely good. Hug is definitely good. Sure. Although, what if it's one of those hugs where the shoulders are touching, the hips are eight feet apart? Yeah, that's a brutal, I hate that. You know how they do that? Also, uh, you know, a, a shake is bad. A shake is bad. Yeah. But what if it's the two-hander, the hand on the bottom, the hand on the top, the warm look in the eyes? Hand sandwich. Right. Absolutely. Well, I, it's open to interpretation because so much depends on the layering uh -huh. and the quality of the wetness in the eyes. That... Guess who? Hey, 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 hey. So anyway, they're talking about what the greeting could be, and the meaning she... behind each as well. It's not just what the greeting is; it's the meaning of that greeting. Right, right. Because they think that'll give them that'll give the idea of what they it's a signal. Yeah, she sneaks up behind them before they can find out, and well, you get it... this. <laughs> Go ahead. She sneaks up behind him before he sees her and does the guess who with her hands yeah. over his eyes. This, this guess who. And then, and then, and then shakes, it, grabs and his grabs, wrists and yeah. shakes them with they're like They're like holding hands, but then shaking back yeah, and, and forth. And then Jordan, like Jordan's Moroccan like, hey. style, like maracas. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? Needless to say, neither of them know exactly how to... Like, no idea what that means. Interpret this. And yeah. I, I, to be fair, neither would I. No, I, I would have, have a damn clue either. Someone like, comes up to me and starts just shaking me. I'm like, what's going on? I kind of think that my date is going very sideways at this point. <laughs> Although, again, ladies of Maybe shelf Maybe if you're life. at, like, Dave and Buster's or some sort of, like, Chuck E. Cheese or something, and they're excited about Chuck winning e. something. I don't no. Well, like if you're like a David Buster's or like a, a arcade or something, and you're all right. So two things here, ladies of <laughs> shelf life. If we ever go on a date, or if anyone knows anyone that ends up going on a date with me, definitely have them start by grabbing my hands and shaking my wrists because I think that would be hilarious if somebody did that to me in real life. Hell yeah. Two, if we end up going on a date, we're going to Chuck E. Cheese or David <laughs> Buster's. <laughs> We're going to play skee like ball a... till the sun comes up. I think that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we end up going back to Jerry's apartment. Oh, one little note that I had about this. What a time to be able to just go to a terminal and sit at a terminal right? to be able to pick someone up. The actual terminal. So weird that you can't do that now. Nope. I, I thought if somebody's under like 25 watching this show... They'd have to be like, they're just How are sitting. you like right next to the plane right now? Yeah. <laughs> Did they buy a ticket? Right. Did they go through security to do this? But it, it was a different time. Different time. So we go back to Jerry's apartment. This is an interesting look. 
for Jerry's first love interest, I put. It's a very 80s look, right? She's got this short little bob Mm -hmm. hair. Mm -hmm. She's got this like floral plaid skirt that goes all the way down to her feet. It's like this, it's a- Did she have a bob or was it a pixie? Oh, maybe it's a pixie. Well, what's a, what's a bob versus a pixie? A bob is actual hair that comes down. A pixie oh, okay. is close to your skull. Okay. So she's got a pixie. And, and a vest. And, yeah, this like Doesn't she have the vest. denim vest on? I don't think it's denim, but it is definitely like a vest. It's like a poofy shirt and a vest. <laughs> I kind of want to wear that one day and just see who looks at me. <laughs> Cause it, but like, hey, the 80s are back in, so I don't think I would get any looks. I thought it was an odd look compared to a lot of the other uh, girlfriends he ends up with. Right. Oh, yeah. This one was very... Conservative? Conservative. That's a good way to say it. I mean, I guess she's a professor in Michigan, so... But Jerry tries to figure out what she's looking for. She asks for wine. Yep. She turns down the lamp. She's getting comfy. She got her shoes off. She takes the shoes off. Of all those things, do any of it sound like she's given signals, or do you think it's a... Well, okay... At this point, it does seem like she's getting very cozy, you know, like, oh, yeah, let's pop over a bottle of wine and do that. To me, the cozy, that, to me, sounds like a signal. That bottle of wine, to me, sounds like a signal. Sure. Yeah, asking for wine does sound like it. Like, I could see if it was a long day, maybe, like, you're, you're, I don't. I would interpret this as as signals. That sounds like, special to me. You're ta- you're turning the lights down. You're taking the shoes off. You're getting in like you're getting that cozy on that the couch. That particular position she gets in on the couch. If you weren't trying to signal something, you would just be sitting on the couch. I, I would in my think opinion. so. Yeah. And I don't. And yeah, the whole asking for wine thing. So I think Jerry is leaning towards that too. Right. And then. She wants to go on a five-hour boat ride around Manhattan. What the <laughs> hell was that? I'm like, are you kidding? Well, and so is Jerry. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, we could do that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Jerry but... does a pretty good job of saying that line for being True. Jerry, like not an actor yet. <laughs> We could do that. Right. But it's like, well, if she wants to do that and she wants to be with me for that amount of time and all of that, again signals of some sort right right There's something going on so jerry kind of agrees that yeah we could do that but as he's doing that the phone rings and it's someone looking for laura yep now jerry does do that sweet thing that he does where he hits the back of the phone I know. And, it, and he grabs it you can't do that anymore no like it's such a sweet little move it looks so cool <laughs> <laughs> He oh, also before... says hello before it even isn't near his mouth, too, <laughs> so it's okay. I would say before the phone rings, too, Laura asks if he can stay there a second night. Yes. That's another signal, too. Or, but see, now, this is what we find out. Say what we find out, and then I'm going to tell you what I think she is. <laughs> so, um, she's talking to this person. We get a nicely framed shot, so you see her in the foreground. Jerry's behind her. Trying to understand the situation. Yeah, and making, expressing himself as he finds stuff out. And we find out that she's engaged. Yep, you're engaged. You're engaged? Well, yeah, he says it a few times after she kind of hangs up and says, like, oh, never get engaged. Right. Well, now he has to go on this boat ride and have this woman at his house and she's engaged. Clearly nothing's going to happen here. Right. Now you have been completely friend zoned. Yeah, to put it in a way. To put it in modern day term, friend zoned. Where she's keeping him on the hook as well. She's She knows he's on the hook. She knows he's slightly into her. And she knows she can get away with asking him to do stuff for her mm. and he'll do it. And I think she's a horrible person. I don't like people who <laughs> manipulate others like that, but that's how I see her. So you think she's doing this on purpose? On purpose. Interesting. Yeah. I don't think she's so naive that she thinks, oh, he's just a nice guy and he's going to do all these things for me. No, I think she's got him on the hook and she's not going to let him go because she knows she does. So I don't like it. <laughs> Interesting. And I feel I, bad I don't for know. Jerry. I don't know if I really put it in that terms. I think she was just... You think she's <sighs> naive about that? You think I she's just know. like, you know, we're just friends type of thing? Or... I don't think she meant anything bad by it. I really don't. But I, I mean, I don't know. I guess I think that she just thought... I think that she didn't think about it. 
but I don't maybe, know. Maybe, maybe. I mean, that could be the other side of it, is that she is just kind of like, oh, well, Jerry is a cool guy, and maybe I can call him because he's the only other person I know in New York. And since I am in a bad situation, he'll help me out, right? Yeah. Which so I maybe is, that is the way she's thinking of it. It is a it. bit of taking advantage of him either way. Right. Like, I mean, she does, but she does say, like, if it isn't an inconvenience and stuff to him. Right. Lot, she's, so. Right. But she could be manipulating him by saying all these things. I'm just saying. I'm just going to throw that out there. So <laughs> She's just throwing that out there. That's her hot take. That's her hot take. But, I mean, there are a few sides to it. And so, I mean, we could give her the benefit of the doubt, but... I don't know. Just it just I had that weird feeling of oh uh, she like manipulating him. It's gross. <laughs> then we get the stand up, and this is where we get the stand up of women want one thing and men want another, and what do men want? They want women, and the stand up here is pretty good to close the show. Uh, yeah. It's it's pretty solid. Maybe some typical stand up, if you will, but if you wheel, still still good. And that is the end of the Seinfeld Chronicles. So, the pilot episode. The pilot episode. So, Rachel, I'll let you go first. What did you think of the Seinfeld Chronicles as an episode? I thought it was fine. I don't think it hit exactly Seinfeld feeling. Like, it didn't feel fully Seinfeld to me yet. I do see where people were coming from saying, oh, it feels too New York. And mm-hmm. I kind of blame that on George. <laughs> Because he felt very New Yorker. Stereotypical, almost. And I was like, okay, I can see where they're coming from. It's hard to, like, totally relate to the characters at that point. So, unless you are in that situation. But I'm like, okay, kind of, they're, but they're feeling it out. They're kind of getting their characters ready. And I still kind of, I liked how it was set up. I like that setup. I enjoy the feeling of this type of sitcom. Yeah, I will say that I didn't, I honestly didn't think that it was too bad. There's parts that aren't too bad. It's not fully baked. Mm -mm. You can see areas of what the show can be. Uh, It's kind of like shelf life for some people. Maybe there's some reviewers out there saying like, you know, there's an idea out there for sure. But no, leave us a five star review. We've got it perfect right now. But (laughs) the, (laughs) I mean, yes. We're a bit of a parody ourselves. There are little convos about nothing. It was better than I remembered and expected. Sure. Not exactly good. It didn't like blow you away. Yeah, but it was better than I remembered. Right. Two little notes to that I didn't talk about. Um, an NBC executive was actually the per- one that suggested having Jerry do stand up at the beginning of the episodes. Oh, interesting. And George was supposed to also be a stand up because it's supposed to be Larry. But then they rewrote they rewrote it to have George not be a stand up. I'm she glad they did that. I'm yeah. very glad they did that because instead they tend to poke and make fun of stand up comedians. And I they, kind they of do. like that. Well, and I think having George be something else allows for a little more diversity in the right. jokes too. Right. So that is the Seinfeld Chronicles. And we'll get into Mail and Bonnie, but first, let's take a quick break. As a guy, I don't know how I can break up with another guy. You know what I mean? I don't know how to say, Bill, I feel I need to see other men. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? There is nothing I can do. I have to wait for someone to die. (laughs) I think that's the only way out of this relationship. It could be a long time. See, the great thing about guys is that we can become friends based on almost nothing. Just two guys will just become friends just because they're two guys. That's almost all we need to have in common. Because sports, sports and women is really all we talk about. If there was no sports and no women, the only thing guys would ever say is, uh, so what's in the refrigerator? And we're back with a, another episode of Seinfeld Season 1. But we've kind of got to get into, Rachel, what happened to them after the pilot aired. Okay. Because that gives us an idea of how we get to the rest of season one. Sure, sure. So the pilot airs on June 5th, 1989, terrible time. And what really makes the show sink a little bit in the eyes of NBC, what what, what they said was the NBC's executives thought it was funny. The people in, in the office thought it was funny. Sure. But then the higher ups and the test audiences thought it wasn't. We kind of talked about that. They thought it was too New York. It was too Jewish. 
Jerry laughs about the fact that the show was considered new, funny, unusual, and appealing to young adults, and therefore it, they didn't want to pick it up. Because it was That's too... why? Well, I think he's jo- half joking oh, about okay. all that. But I, I think the idea is that it was so different that they didn't know what to do with it. Gotcha. But what happens is a couple of the guys that were producers on the show were like, well, then we'll just, they thought it was dead at NBC because of the test audience that came back. So they decided, well, we'll try a different channel. They went to Fox to pitch the show. Okay, interesting. Which is interesting because we know what Fox is doing at this same time. They're trying to get the Simpsons ready. They're trying to get married with children ready. So they're all about different kinds of shows. No, that's why, yeah, that is why it's interesting that they went to Fox, yeah. Fox turned them down. Hmm. Yeah, which, Hmm. I mean, can you imagine if they had The Simpsons and Seinfeld and Married with Children? They would have been, uh, you know, a bigger network than they are now. I mean, now they're, well, they're consumed by Disney, I guess, but... Greed. hmm. Consumed by greed, you mean. Well, part of the, I mean, well... (laughs) Greed on both ends. The, yeah. the Fox network that remains and the part that got consumed by Disney. Exactly. <laughs> um, so anyway, what ends up happening is, I hope I get the producer that did this right, Rick Ludwin, who was one of the execs at NBC. He decides he really likes the show. Mm-hmm. He go, he decides to go to bat for the show. He thinks they've got something. And he, he says in a documentary thing that I watched, he's like, I wasn't Jewish. I'm not from New York. I thought it was funny, so he decides to go to bat for it. He goes to the president of NBC, and he gives up some of his budget that he had for other projects, for late-night projects, to get episodes of Seinfeld made. Now, the budget that he gave up allowed for four episodes. (laughs) That's still quite a bit, though. Well, a typical, I mean, we've seen kind of like the typical first season. It, it's anywhere between like 6 and 13, something like that sure. to kind of get your, your show going. No, that makes sense. So four episodes was low. Okay. And Jason Alexander, who had the most experience, was like, oh, four, great. I, I guess I won't move out to LA. And like Michael, <laughs> Michael Richards, who has experience, was like, four, I guess they owe somebody something. And Jerry says that he thought that was, like, a good thing, and Larry was freaked out that he had to write four episodes. But the people that had the experience just thought, okay, well, they're trying, but they're not really going to, they don't really care. That was the thought. But, okay. yeah, it is, it is an interesting bit of trivia about how the rest of season one got made because of the fact that this guy gave up some other projects to try to get Seinfeld going. Exactly. I mean, you're putting a lot into it, then. You're, it's literally putting your money where your, where your mouth is. Mm-hmm. Really. Exactly. So kudos to him for doing that because who? it probably wouldn't have, we wouldn't have it. One of my, one of the interesting thought experiments that I always have is what happens if something as trivial as a television show that happens to be super popular even at the time or still today didn't exist. Because like, you want to think that these things are... We're talking about trivial shit here, right? right. Like, and that's the whole point of our show. It, you want to think it doesn't have an impact at all? Right, but you kind of know it would. I think it's... it would have an impact. I mean, you've you got to think about the type of people who would watch this stuff, too. I mean... Right, what they grow up on, what, mm-hmm. how they talk, how they learn. Right. Yeah. You know, we learned a lot from Arthur. I mean, we're going we're gonna to have to do a thing on Arthur and talk about that one, well, I would think. And if Arthur comes out on Blu-ray or 4K, I am buying that. I don't care what the price is. PBS, you put a price on that, I will buy that <laughs> shit. The entire, the entire, the entire Arthur catalog. collection. That's yeah. right. The entire thing. Yes. Worth on the it. shelf. 100%. Immediately. We already know it's on the shelf. Spoiler <laughs> we'll alert, there. Arthur is we'll on the there. shelf. <laughs> we'll get to Arthur. I don't know, I don't know when, but we'll, we will. So anyway... What ends up happening is they're given a choice. They start writing these episodes, and they're given one note by the studio. And that one note is, we need a woman on the show. You need to bring in a woman. And they decide that's fair. It makes sense to have a female character. And Larry yeah, decides... I feel like it's kind of weird not to have a female character. Yeah. I mean, I guess because the way that they were writing it, it was like, well, there was no woman in Jerry's life. Uh, okay. But it, the show is more based on Larry David's life than Jerry's. You can all truth like jerry is playing himself but the circumstances around 
J- George is Larry, right? Sure. <laughs> oh, so Jerry's... actually, are we trying to say that Seinfeld is actually all about George Costanza? <laughs> or it's actually from George's perspective? Because well, we we're in the audience when we video. watch when we watch Jerry on stage, George would be in the audience, right? Eh? It's it's possible. <laughs> you can, again, get that YouTube video ready. That I'm George just coming is actually up with the protagonist. All the conspiracy theories. Yeah, George is the protagonist, or or is it Kramer? Oh, well, it's definitely not Kramer. It's definitely not Kramer. <laughs> <laughs> right. But Larry has a friend of his that the, that he did date previously, Monica Yates. And they decided to become friends after they broke up. And it worked out, and they're, like, friends. So Larry decides to make that in, to write that in for Jerry. Mm-hmm. So I it's think not what it boils... it's not really a love interest. It's a friendship. It's even a though... friend. Yeah. Because it's cause... a little deeper. Cuts a little deeper. Well, because Jerry and Larry did not want a love interest to spark between the characters. They sure. Larry was very adamant about it, and Jerry agreed. That they wanted them to just be friends. Which is funny because now sitcoms nowadays... Force it, it. They force that to happen. So they might be friends with the girl or the guy right on the show. And then people want them to get together so they well, force it to happen. And it's like, a, it doesn't need to happen. But they there's can a, be friends. You know why that, that they force it. And, and we'll talk about it down the line. Stay tuned for... It's on the list, you know, upcoming. It's because of Jim and Pam. Like, that's why... I know, but uh, come on. (laughs) Even that was like, okay, the second they get together, end the damn thing. Just end it, because nothing is going to come after that. Because the whole thing was them flirting back and forth all the time. And that was the whole thing. After they got together, I got bored. I will say that right now, I got bored with that show after they got together. Well, hey, spoiler alert for a future episode. Save it it for for that time. (laughs) But what I was going to say is I think a lot of this is based off of Larry. One, because he's probably the better writer of the two between Larry and Jerry. Okay. So he's the one coming up with more ideas. But the second part being, I think Larry's more, what what do I want, experienced in the world? He okay. has more He has more stuff to pull in from life that's okay. weird. Because he's so eccentric. <laughs> right. So that, like yeah, he has a lot. I feel like Jerry is just so, I feel like Jerry is an introvert. Probably. Like, I feel like he eats, he, he gets home from the club, he eats his bowl of cereal, he gets up, he reads the paper. Yeah, he's just he, kind of, he, like, every like, day. That's all he does. Yeah. And I feel like Larry is so spastic and eccentric that he just has a lot of weirder stuff to pull on than Jerry. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I could see they, that being the, the way it is for them in real life, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's why a lot of the background comes from Larry's experiences, because Jerry would be like, I don't know, uh, we'll just bring in another neighbors. If he wouldn't have, I guess I talked to another neighbor, life. right? Yeah. <laughs> so they make the character of Elaine. The character was originally named Eileen. I like Elaine a lot more. I like I don't know Elaine why, better too. Yeah. But Elaine works better than Feels Eileen. Feels softer. <laughs> yeah. Just like word wise, it feels like a softer word. You can than say Elaine. Fl- Elaine. Uh, Elaine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It flows off the tongue. So they decide to read a bunch of people for this. They read Megan Mullally from She Ends Up on Will and Grace. She's Tammy on Parks and Rec. I prefer Put, Tammy on Parks and Rec. I, I prefer saying. Tammy on Parks and Rec. Uh, <laughs> Patricia Patricia Heaton from Every, Everybody Loves Raymond, his wife on Everybody Loves Raymond. Okay. They Ooh, read Roseanne. That would have been a bad one. Roseanne. Oh, God, no. As Elaine. Absolutely not. Oh, hey, Jerry. That would have been the worst. Oh, Get immediately out. done. One season out, done. <laughs> They determined that, so Larry suggested Julia, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, from his season on SNL. Okay. Julia comes in, uh, according to Michael Richards, <laughs> it's hard to tell when Michael Richards is being serious and when he's joking in, <laughs> in any of these interviews. Uh-oh. I guess just like that time that he got in trouble like 15 years ago, too. Oh, clearly, God. I think he was trying to joke then, but we'll get into that later, or in a different episode. So Michael Richards is like, he remembers Julia showed up wearing cowboy boots. Okay. And he does this like, oh, yes, this is our girl. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, it's possible that he was joking about it, but also being serious about it. <laughs> like, wait a minute. 
cowgirl yeah. boots hold on hold on <laughs> um my side note here that you can cut out if you want to rachel is of all of the people that have been on seinfeld and there's a ton of people on seinfeld mm-hmm. i really did not expect spoiler alert for the end of black widow or end credits of black widow to get excited oh for my god Elaine. right <laughs> like the fact like, that oh. julia is that she is she is the she's probably the best actor of all of them oh i would think so she has been actor yes yeah and she's done multiple things now like she in veep or Mm -hmm. the um old adventures of new christine yeah new adventures of old christine um (laughs) one of those one of the other both shows they should make a prequel called the old the new (laughs) the old old adventures of new New christine (laughs) (laughs) it's a prequel but obviously she was she fit in with the cast right away absolutely but to think that now she's in the mcu and it's, she's a she's the surprise <laughs> elaine bennis is the surprise oh my god it was exciting though movie. i was like oh elaine hello so what ends up happening is that they've written these stories they have filmed the shows they filmed the shows in the spring of 1990 and the president of nbc or one of the execs comes up to the exec for seinfeld and says well you have a choice you can either take a spot in the spring in a worse time slot and try to make the fall schedule or you can take the summer and take the slot after cheers reruns but you won't be able to make the fall schedule okay and they decide the guy that says like it, it didn't make he knew exactly what he was going to do we're taking the we're taking the spot after cheers okay so they end up so they end up premiering the the rest of these four episodes in the summer of 1990 the first one that they show, I think, is actually the stake app, but that's not what we're doing because we're going in the order on the DVDs. We're going in the production order. Yep. Because that's the order of the actual story. Right. And we're telling the story here. We're not doing, <laughs> we're telling the fucking story, which means after that whole tirade that we go on, we're talking about episode two of Seinfeld, Male Unbonding, which aired on June 14th, 1990, written by Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld, directed by Tom Chironis. Mm hmm note about this one is it is the only episode of seinfeld that is not the blank um, oh, that's interesting i didn't think about that yeah and i guess jerry says that they had it called the male on bonding but it didn't fit or yeah, something really so they just well, went with male putting unbonding. The, the on it kind of sounds funky take the the off it's cleaner yeah that's it <laughs> jerry mentions that he didn't want the writers to try to be coming up with clever titles. Mm-hmm. So that's why everything is the blank. Gotcha. And so I, it's just it makes very, total sense. very simplistic, very to the point. Well, he was like, don't waste your energy on trying to come up with a title. And they actually, it actually is more distinguishable because it's the blank mm-hmm. nowadays. You think about the Simpsons that we love and you can tell that the writers put in a lot of work to come up with a clever title. Right. And it's like, is it really worth it? You don't need to come up with a clever title. No. A lot of people don't even look at the title of the episodes. Especially back then when they didn't realize that this stuff was going to be on TV forever. And sure. people would know the epi- episode titles. Right. You didn't know the episode titles in 1990. No. I feel like, if you want to call them normal people, probably don't know episode titles now. <laughs> the normies. You know, the normies out there. So, let's get into it. This, so like we said, the pilot a year before, now they've kind of, a year later, they've refurbished a lot of the stuff about the show. Mm -hmm. It looks very different. The theme is here now. The theme written by Jonathan Wolf. I hope he's a very, I hope he's a very rich man for coming up with this theme too. Oh yeah. (laughs) Because this is so much better. And it's iconic. It's classic. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It makes... So much more sense than the previous theme. It really embodies it what gives Seinfeld is. Much yeah. more character. Yeah. Because it's this, you know, it's, it makes sense for what Seinfeld is. This exactly. nonsense show. Jerry is giving stand-up about men with tools. I didn't write anything else after that. So he's just talking about tools. Well, he's talking about men and fixing things and how it make it flocks all men together just to bond about being manly men and fixing things all right yeah you fit it in with the the idea of the show 
Yeah. Because I, I guess it, the whole idea of this show is men's relationships with each other. Exactly. Like that is, that's the theme behind this episode. Right. It's not just men with tools. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, because it is like, he he's like, the only reason that there's a wall up at a construction site is so that a man doesn't come up and be like, oh, what do you got there? Steel girder? Yeah. Looks good. <laughs> Should hold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I can't say the same. I'm not a handyman. Dad tried to make me a handyman, which would have been helpful in life, but I didn't take. Instead, I'm <laughs> wasting hours of my life talking about... 30 year old episodes of Seinfeld with you. Yeah, you know. it's a, that's a bit more constructive. I think, I think Dad's fine with it. It's good. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> it gives him something to do when right. something happens to my house. Yeah. So the apartment is the first facade that we see, and it's right now. Now we get the, the right wall of Jerry's apartment, mm-hmm. and it starts with George and Jerry in the apartment lobby, which is not something that we get to see very often. No. Uh, it comes up a few times in the in the series but not very often but they're in the lobby and george is complaining that he said something wrong to a woman (laughs) this wouldn't Um, be the last time (laughs) (laughs) i thought that george starts in this one he's a little more george now oh he is definitely more george now he's a little less sure of himself than he was in the pilot and i like that it feels better so I guess what happens is he put his hand in his pocket to get some money and he got some dental floss stuck on his hand <laughs> and he's worried that his girlfriend is going to leave him because of it. Because of the dental and, floss. Right. And, it, and that is something where it's just like, it's very George, where it's something so stupid, but he thinks that it's, and it's small, who would care? Right. Like, oh, okay, but, you had dental floss at one point. But... We know that this crew of people would care about that if their boyfriend or girlfriend would do that. He had dental floss in his hand. Right. Like, oh, yeah. They would be totally turned around. They'd judgmental completely on the opposite end. Yeah. Well, well she had do- dental floss so in they, her purse. So they think the no same about themselves. No way I'm staying with this one. Right. So, so they think that, well, if I'm judging that person, then they're judging me. Right. I think we've all been there or have been on either side of that where you're Absolutely. judging someone on something really stupid and small. Which is the whole point, again, of the show. Or like, or you just have horrific anxiety, and you think something's big, but on the other oh, end, yeah. if you if they did it to you, you'd be like, well, it's not a big deal, but I did it, so it's got to be a huge deal. <laughs> I say something stupid all the time, and I think, man, I'm going to get in trouble for that one, or like, <laughs> man, they're going to remember that, and they're going to hate me forever. And the person probably doesn't even remember you said it. No, because it doesn't matter, because it's okay. <laughs> but, oh, God. So Jerry asks George if it's not because of the floss, but it's because of the fanny pack. Because <laughs> George is wearing a fanny pack in this first scene. Yeah. Which was a thing back then. Just I don't, to walk they... around with a fanny pack. Like, that just seems odd to me. Is Was that not a, that wasn't a thing It must back have been then? a thing, just to have a fanny pack. I think it's a thing for hipsters now. Like, like look, I have my fanny pack. Well, see, okay, but... here, here, I'll, I'll, I'll spill this. The only time I ever wear a fanny pack is if we are in an amusement park, or I'm running, or hiking, or something like that, because then it's attached to me, and I don't have pockets. So that is my pocket, right? Sure. But I don't have it where it's like this giant fanny pack from the 90s that's colorful and really showy. Yeah, it's usually George's... hidden. <laughs> yeah. No, this is big. George is rocking this fanny pack. Oh, yeah. Because it's bright blue against his khakis or whatever he's wearing. <laughs> I don't know if it has, if it's made an unironic comeback. I do feel like if you go to a music festival, you'll see hipsters wearing it. Probably. Thinking that it's funny because it's not funny. But, well, I mean, the 80s and the 90s are making a comeback. The fashion sense and I everything. Think we might be so, past the 80s at this point, but... Well, Gen Z. Z is obsessed with the 90s. You're Zoomers. Who, you know, we hope that you're all listening, Zoomers. But Gen Z is obsessed with the 90s. Because they weren't born yet. Exactly. It's like us with the 80s. Yeah, that makes sense. It's the, it's the right like before you. I do like 80s fashion. It is kind but of that, like and it's, fun. I think, I think it's all because that's what you watched when you were a little kid. That's it true. It shows from then. So, so like then it's like stuck in your head. Oh, that yeah. makes sense. That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> so they go into the apartment and Kramer is talking on the phone with someone in Jerry's apartment, on Jerry's phone. And Kramer says, oh, he's right here. And he goes to give Jerry the 
phone. Oh, God. And I love this because Jerry is asking, who is it? And Kermit's like, just take it. Just it's take for it. you. Just it's take for it. you. It's for you. Yeah, he won't <laughs> tell him. So, of course, Jerry isn't happy with it. And then he becomes even angrier when he, when he finds out who it is. He, like, kind of slaps Kramer. <laughs> oh, they got a cure for cancer. See, it's all big business. <laughs> oh, hey, Jerry just walked in. Hi, George. Yeah, 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 yeah. Take my number. Uh, it's 555-8643. Okay, here he is. Who is it? Take it. Who is it? It's for you. Hello? Oh, hi, Joel. What? No, uh, I was out of town. I just got back. Kramer doesn't know anything. He's just my next-door neighbor. Jerry struggles to make up a plan or, like, a to get to avoid it before hanging up well because i mean think about it this way show of hands who avoids talking on a phone nowadays yeah, <laughs> like, folks at home, raise oh, your hand. i mean seriously <laughs> but but in what but way, we had like, but it, we have caller id so if you're right. avoiding somebody you just don't answer it yeah but there is i feel like i don't know if this has ever happened to me but i feel like this scenario is still plausible like this is one that technology hasn't gotten away from because, Cra- I mean, this one, yes, because Jerry could just see it's Joel and not pick up. Yeah. But if But if Kramer, somebody ha- was already on the phone with them. Yeah, if he called Kramer, Kramer could then be like, Jerry, it's, it's, it's for you. With right. his phone. True. So this still could have happened if the guy had Kramer's number, which he apparently gets later on in the episode. <laughs> of course. I feel like I have had that scenario happen to me where somebody wants to, me to talk to somebody else, and it's like, right. I, don't to, I don't want to talk to this person. I, like, why, why are you making me talk to them? What are you doing? Like, don't tra- really don't transfer that call to me. Go away. Yeah. <laughs> what we learn is that the person that was on the phone is Jerry's childhood friend, Joel, and Jerry does not like this person. He doesn't want to talk to this person anymore. He was friends with him. The guy wants to still be friends with him, but Jerry was really only friends with him because he lived down the street. They were kids. Sure. He makes the comment that he had a ping pong table. (laughs) I'd have been friends with Stalin if he had a ping pong table. So it's this idea that when you're kids, you you kind of become friends with the people that are close to you in proximity. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, If you're me... You stay friends with those people for 30 years. If you're me, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> you just see them on, you know, like Facebook and stuff just to see what they're up to. I mean, I, well, I, had, I did. There were a couple of other people that I was friends with that were in close proximity that I don't really talk to a lot anymore just because. But it is interesting how that all kind of works out. Yeah. I think if you continue to grow up with them, it, it makes a difference as opposed to not continuing to grow up That's with them. That's true. If they like move away or they go to a different They go to a different school, school or yeah. whatever. Which is typically what happened to me. Right, right. And we, you know, went, went through high school and stuff. Kramer says, starts to go in about his idea to make a pizza place where you make your own pie. <laughs> You toss the dough up in the air, and you spread the sauce and the cheese, and then you put it in the oven. Which comes back later on in the series, of course. Of course. But this is the first mention of this idea. I, I did not remember that he talks about making the pizza place where I you did. make your own pie. I remember this. <laughs> this early on, though, I did not remember that he, he Well, up yeah, this. maybe not this early on, but I do remember some of his crazy schemes, and this was one of them I remember. And he mentions that it would be part of Cramerica Industries, <laughs> which is the first mention of Cramerica Industries, too. Right. Which comes back to play later on again. I need to get the Cramerica Industries shirt. I've got a Stark Industries. I've got a Wayne Enterprises. I need a Cramerica Industries shirt. Definitely. Or Vandalay Industries, one of the two. No, nah, I think both. <laughs> no, both. They're two different industries. Oh, they absolutely are. They're two very distinct different companies. One is an architecture <laughs> firm. With all that also does importing and exporting, and, and one export, is yes, importing and, and, yeah, exporting, and exporting, as we find and, out. And Cramerica Industries is more of like an entrepreneurial, like startup, almost like an angel investing company. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Which I could just see Kramer being an investor. He just yeah, invests if he, in had, like if he had money. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we should write 
now this here's an idea Uh oh this is a hell of an idea here we go we should we should write a fake seinfeld script if they were around today oh where somehow kramer fell ass backwards into money i thought he was i thought he was like he does have money. Like, that's how he yeah. can live that way. Yeah. Because I think he inherited it or right. something. And he just doesn't care. So what if I have this money? And then he goes, well, I'm going in- to invest it. There's a funny Twitter account, or there was, I don't know if it still exists, called Seinfeld Today or something like that, or Seinfeld in the 20th, 21st century, something like that, where it gives you plot ideas for Seinfeld if it existed today. Okay. Like, that's interesting. One of the ones I can remember, two of the ones I can remember are Elaine goes on J-Date which is a site for Jewish singles. Is Elaine and... Jewish? No, but that's okay. the whole idea. Because like, that is something <laughs> that she would do, right? Sure. And her date says that she's too Jewish. And, th- and, and George's... How can I be too Jewish? <laughs> and George's TiVo thinks he's gay. <laughs> oh, I could actually see all of this happening. Yeah, great ideas. I really want someone, folks at home, write those. Please. I want those shows. Fully written. I want those to happen. Even today, like, I don't know. Uh, Kramer gets Kramer gets involved in, you know, the Wall Street Bitcoin. Bets subreddit. Yeah, Bitcoin. or Bitcoin. Absolutely. Oh. Kramer tries to fund Kramer Industries with Bitcoin. Oh like my God, like that. that would be, Absolutely. that would totally happen. <laughs> Jerry gets canceled for saying something on stage. All Ooh, this stuff would yes. be great. And it has to be like the most inoffensive thing ever. I would love that. Most inoffensive. Yes. And they don't tell it. Like, they don't tell you what he said. Like, yeah, the they, yeah, you never episode. find out what he says. <laughs> and then the rest of the crew are like, like, yeah, I heard what you said on stage. He's like, why is everybody talking about this? <laughs> it goes okay. viral on TikTok or something. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, now that we've given the internet plenty of fodder for, for, <laughs> for this, Jerry says he hates talking to this guy. But what is he going to do? Is he going to break up with him? How do you break up with a guy? How do you break break up with a a friend? And George is like, yeah, just pretend he's a woman. Break up with him. Tell him the truth. And they both kind of cringe at the idea of having to tell him the truth. Yeah. This whole idea of having to break up with with someone of the same sex. I don't know if I've ever had to go through with Platonic relationship, though. Yeah, a platonic. uh, You're right. I'm sorry. Uh, Apologies. For a platonic relationship. Yeah. Well, for me, the same sex. But yeah, True. someone yeah. with a pl- but I understand platonic what you relationship. Mean. Yeah, to break up with someone in a platonic relationship. I don't know if I've ever had to do it just because I have so I have a, a small sect of very close friends. Yeah. That even when we get pissed off at each other, it, it's gonna pass. Like you're not it's not gonna this be too a... shall pass. I mean, have I had to No, I just let it just like wilt. Yeah. You just kind of let kind it of wilt. Ignore, you ignore the phone when they call. But you do. Usually some... usually it was kind of an agreed upon, a silently agreed upon, like, let's not be friends anymore type of thing. And you just stop talking. I kind of would want to know, <laughs> folks at home, have you had to do this where you have a platonic relationship with someone and you have to do this breakup? Because I do feel like I, I feel like I've had this a couple of times in my life, but to your point, like you don't break up with them. You just kind of ignore them. Yeah. You just kind of let it and they like, just, just kind of fall go apart. away. Yeah. yeah. The, the line you don't that comes completely up... ghost it, but you just kind of let it drift. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you fewer and fewer times are you available to do yes. anything with this person. Right. I think I agree with Jerry when he says several seasons down the line that I already have three friends. Yeah, why do I, I need I more? I don't need any more. Yeah. And I kind of... It's, it's kind like of, too, it's too much to handle when you have more friends. Yeah. It's like, come on. <laughs> I already have three friends. I don't want any more. It's enough. And I think that right there proves that he's an introvert. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we get a little bit of stand-up here. If there were no sports and there was no and there were no women, men would have nothing to talk about. Straight uh, men. <laughs> well, the, I feel like and, we always have to explain this. Like straight men, yes. <laughs> I then, guess for the time of this, like would have gay friends that that's pretty much all we talk about too. <laughs> no, you're right. That's true. That is all he has to talk about. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, my father's gay. <laughs> our show is not talking about sports nor women not necessarily all the time we're talking about nonsense most of the time <laughs> but we're not you know we're brother and sister so it's it's a different kind of well yeah it's a different relationship right and i guess my guy friends we don't always talk about sports 
But sports is one of the subjects that we talk about, for, for sure. And women. <laughs> Even though I think they're all married. <laughs> I mean, I guess I can't have an opinion on this. Me and my guy friends tend to talk about sports. <laughs> Right. And video games. I think I think the closer and you like the are, the single ones are we talk about women. I think the closer you are with them, the more you you veer away from sports and women. Yeah, because you got more like, like the further they are into the acquaintance realm. I think it is a good observation because if you're just acquaintances with someone like coworkers or whatever, mm-hmm. you're talking about sports. A hundred percent. And if it's like people that you're not really close with, maybe you're talking about your you know, significant others or something like that. Right. And the closer you get, the more that you know the person, then you're they talking about... They open up a little bit more, the stuff that they're yeah. into, their then hobbies. Then you're talking about and... four hours of Seinfeld, you're talking about exactly. movies, you're talking about TV. <laughs> so anyway, we get our first look of Monks, and this is where I thought that the show seemed in color, less like the 80s. It seems sharper. Yeah. It seems more... It has that more charcoal-y color than that bright 80s look. A lot of contrast, I think, is what yeah. you're thinking. Yeah. And that's what, I, and I don't know if it was just because it's our first look of monks, but it felt more Seinfeldy. Okay. Here. And Jerry is trying to engage with this guy, Joel. Joel is played by Kevin Dunn. <laughs> Kevin Dunn, congratulations. Welcome back. Congratulations. Yeah. Woo! You are the first repeat actor on Shelf Life. <laughs> I don't know. I. I wouldn't have put that one in the in the in the pool if we had to bet on who the first no. repeat actor was going to be. I think it's hilarious. But coming back from our episode on Small Soldiers, see the back catalog if you if this is your first episode that you're joining. But look at that, we got some fun trivia for our our, our podcast already. Yeah, for, <laughs> yeah, for our podcast wiki. For you lifers that are taking care of the podcast wiki, make sure that it says Kevin Dunn was the first repeat actor. <laughs> Please, I want an entire page on Kevin Dunn. <laughs> Just because of that. <laughs> he's, he, Kevin Dunn is actually, joking aside, is doing a really good job in oh, this yeah. episode. He does. He has to be like this manic asshole yeah, in that, this episode. He's an asshole. <laughs> Absolutely. The, First class. He, he just keeps talking about shit. He just keeps going off and on and off about complaining about stuff to Jerry. And Jerry keeps trying to engage in this conversation. And the guy is not listening. No, he's not paying attention. Not to anything Jerry says. It could it could be well, like he says, he's going to what? Where does he he's say gonna he's go, going? He's gonna go do a show in Iran or yeah. something like that. Yeah. And it's and the guy's just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sounds good. That yeah, right. Oh yeah, they would do that. Okay, you're not listening at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and oh No, I was gonna say, and then like he's such a jerk to the waitress. Come on. Yes, he uh, the waitress comes over, and he complains about whether or not it's real turkey, and or, or he, like a thing in a tube, turkey roll. Oh, a turkey. I don't roll. know what the hell that I'm is. I'm assuming it's like a paste that's like they put in like you know, and they roll it up type of thing, like a paste. That sounds gross, but you know what I mean, right? Like I, a meat I, paste. I, yeah, I looked it. I just googled it now. It's. I don't, it's, I guess, is it, it's more like, is it processed meat? Well, that's what I'm saying, right? Because it looks like, I don't know, it looks kind of weird. I was thinking, is it some sort of a ham roll? You know when you get a ham roll at, like, a funeral or whatever else a ham roll might be served? No. Are you, you know, when you get, rat? like, a roll of ham. They take a piece of ham and they roll it up. Like, is that the same thing as rolling a piece of turkey? I don't think so. This is a, I don't. I actually have no idea what this man is talking about. I assumed it was like, is it some sort of processed meat? I assume and... I, that's what I was thinking. But I was thinking like maybe it was like a paste that they they make into a roll. I don't know. That sounds gross. But it's like this allows me to tell this story on air, though. Uh oh. Um, okay, I'm excited. I don't know what you're gonna say. No, it's a very short little anecdote. Okay. <laughs> um, so years ago, I remember mom and I went to go get Arby's. Okay. And we went into the Arby's to buy the food. And it's it's an Arby's, right? It felt like an Arby's night. So we were ordering our food, and the guy behind us walks up to the counter, and he goes, is this processed meat? Oh, God. At Arby's. Sure. And the girl goes, I'm not sure. And he goes, well, is it, if it's not, if it's processed meat, I don't want it. 
and he walked out of the pl- out of Arby's. Okay. So I don't know if the girl was gonna check or not. And probably I'm not assuming... because she probably doesn't know how. She probably would ask the manager, and then the manager would have to ask somebody else because they just work there. That's just like and some also... teenager working at Arby's, right? <laughs> Yeah, right, but also, sir, you're at an Arby's. Do you not know what you just walked into? Like, it has a drive through I don't think that m- necessarily means it's processed meat. It probably is. But I'm, like, just I, saying it's not necessarily I don't wanna, true. I don't want to... Uh, Are you looking it up now? If Arby's smirch has, the name of second. Arby's if it isn't processed meat. I assume it is just because it's fast food, but folks at home, write in. Let us know if Arby's is processed meat or not. I really don't know. But... Apparently, monks might be using turkey roll instead of real turkey. Jerry basically realizes, like, how he treated the waitress. And he goes, like, how can you talk to someone that... that like, that, that, like that, that made him snap. And he was able to just yeah. be like, what are you doing? No. And he tries to break up with him, but the guy keeps going on. And he kind of initiates it and does it. And he's just, he plays it out like you would break up a real relationship. of just Exactly. Like, it's, this isn't working out. We don't have anything in common. And Kevin Dunn does an, an awesome job. He starts crying and he starts shouting like, I always tell everybody about you. Go see a show. And... <laughs> Listen, Joel. I don't think we should see each other anymore. <laughs> this friendship, it's not working. Not working? What are you talking about? We're just not suited to be friends. But how can you say that? Look, you're a nice guy. It's just that we don't have anything in common. Wait, wait, wait what did I do? Tell me what, I want to know what I did. You, you didn't do anything. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> it's, this is very difficult. Look, I, I know I call you too much, right? I mean, I, I, I know, you're a very busy guy. No, it's not that. You're one of the few people I can talk to. Now, come on, that's not true. No, I always tell everybody about you and tell everybody to go see a show. <laughs> I mean, I'm your biggest fan. I know, I know. I mean, you're my best friend. Best friend? I've never been to your apartment. I cannot believe that this is happening. I can't believe it. Okay, okay, forget it. It's okay. So he makes this big scene, and Jerry T's trying to back like, you, it's me. Yeah. Huh? He starts to backpedal a little bit. Yeah, so Jerry starts backpedaling, and he says, like, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. We'll still go. We'll still go. We'll go. St- we'll still go where? To the Knicks game. I don't so know Jerry if we talked offers... about that. Oh, yeah, I don't think we have talked about that. So Jerry offers him, Jerry had offered him a ticket to the Knicks game. He had two tickets to the Knicks game, and he had offered him a ticket to the Knicks game. So he still says, like, no, we can still go to the Knicks game. We can still go. And it's for this Wednesday. Not right. next Wednesday. Yeah. I get into this with people all the time because if we were to say we're recording this on a weekend, if I were to say this Tuesday, yep, I literally mean four days from now. This, this coming Tuesday. Tuesday. If I say next Tuesday, I mean 10 days from now or whatever, like the next week. <laughs> I This is how people should talk. <laughs> Period. Oh my um, gosh. So Joel, I mean, technically, though, if you think about it, hold on. Your thought okay, process Rachel, Rachel doesn't 100% work. Are you going to get on the soapbox well, about this? Is no, this no, a no, Rachel no. soapbox? No, 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 no. No soapbox. A Rachel rant? I'm just, I'm just seeing the logic in what you're saying. So you're saying this Tuesday is the next, like this, this coming Tuesday, right? Yes. But it also is the next Tuesday that we will see. Yes. So you could say next Tuesday, and it mean the Tuesday that okay, is in but a couple if it's, of days. All right, yes. If if it's a Wednesday, uh, I understand that. But if it's a Monday, and you're talking about this Wednesday, you're talking yes, about that the Wednesday, Wednesday that's in two days, yes. But the next Wednesday is Would not be like this Wednesday. like next week's Wednesday. Yes, the next See, means it's, it's not It's the, because the we're not using a full sentence, I think. So it's like this coming Tuesday, right? next week's wednesday it makes more sense if you add one little word in i i kind of want i kind of want all of the people at home to to weigh in on this as well see this is this is what's (laughs) good about the seinfeld series of shelf life is we're getting a lot of these social cues worked out here exactly we need to i think i'm right 
on this one. I'm, I'm not wrong. saying you're wrong or I'm right. Wrong 95% I'm just saying. Of the time, I think I'm right about this one. <laughs> so he goes right back to berating the staff. He's like, where is this waitress? George and Jerry are then at the bank. George has a giant bucket of pennies. <laughs> And George is telling how this girl ended up breaking up with him. Yep. And they went out to lunch, and the girl broke up with him at lunch before they ordered. And basically what happens is George has to make a decision of whether to finish the meal (laughs) or leave, because it was before the meal came. Right. And he decides to sit there and finish the lunch. So, Rachel, I posited this to you. Would oh, you have sat boy. there and finished the lunch? All right, well, you said it was before they ordered. Was it before they ordered? Was it So it was after they ordered, but bef- before they ate, there's food. I can't remember. Were, are they sitting there together eating still? Yeah. Like, so they broke up, and they're just going to sit They broke up. They're sitting together? there awkwardly eating together. I'd the probably table. box it up and head out. I mean... <laughs> That's a good solution. That's actually. what I would Can do. I it's like, well, you know what? I'm going to yeah. get this to go because we just broke up. No, I don't want to be sitting I'm not going to tell the wait. I'm not going to tell the waitress oh, why no, 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 I want no, no, this no. to go. No, no, no. They don't care. They could care less. I just want this boxed up so I can pay for it and leave. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd now probably, here's the yeah. question, though. Who is paying for it? Is the person well, who broke up with you... I think the breaker it? upper should I be think, paying for I think I agree. I think the breaker upper should pay for the meal. According to George, he paid had to pay for it. I mean, the I, the other thought is is that you pay for your own and you leave. That's fine too. Yeah. But at the very least, the break the break up er needs to put some cash down on the table. Here. No, I agree. Yeah, they have to pay for the tip. Yes. Oh, <laughs> they have to pay the tip as well. Oh yeah, because now you just you just made an awkward situation for the the server. So I okay. say you have to pay for the tip. I think this is all fair. I, I think we can. I think we can make that a thing. With you saying that, if I were the if I were the breakup e, I would feel a little bit like, well, at least I got a free, I got the meal out of it. At least I got a free sandwich out of it or whatever. Yeah, it's it's your comfort food. Yeah, absolutely. And I would also say that if you are the breaker upper, make sure you order before because you don't need the break e ordering something extravagant, knowing that you're gonna pay for well, it as okay. the guilty party here. If you were to have done the breakup before <laughs> ordering it all, there's no way leave. anybody Yeah, you just leave. No food is being ordered. <laughs> I mean I feel like you'd have like you want to get this done right away, right? Yeah, but why did you do it at a restaurant? I don't know why you're doing it at a restaurant to begin with. <laughs> like why are you like let's do this somewhere where it's not a restaurant. Whatever. Yeah, let's pull back for a second. You're at a restaurant. Did this just occur to you that second? Well, that's how Jerry did with it you. with Joel. Yeah, but they were already going to go eat and stuff. So that was already a plan. And he wasn't really going to do it because he, he was wussing out on it. And he up, went, you know yeah. what? Screw this. You're a jerk to the waitress. I'm doing this now. A guy brings up Patrick Ewing while they're standing in line. So they're talking about the, the Knicks. Like mm-hmm. Patrick Ewing is not going to be her. He's not going to be out. Okay. And that reminds Jerry to tell George he gave the ticket away. Right. George thinks it's a joke, but then realizes it's terrible. He's like all pissed off about it. He's like, how could you do this to me? I like this a little bit because, again, it is more realistic that you wouldn't just be talking about the plot. Right. They're talking about something that has nothing to do with the plot, and then something comes up, and then they remember it. So then they, they talk right. about the Right, which is very real life. I mean, I guess, do we have like a plot? <clears throat> do we just have yeah, weird it's... arches that happen in life? Hold on. Having like a thing. Oh, you mean in real life? In real life, do we have just arches that currently, like, that just concurrently happen? And then there's also little side stories that happen in our own lives. So we have like an overarch, like small well, every, arches that happen. Everyone has their own protagonist. Sure. That's like the major arch. I'm talking about little arches that happen, you know, like little plots that that go on in our lives and then we have like little offshoots that we remember during those those plots it just sounds interesting to me to think of life that way you can again make your make your master's thesis on that one or or we could make a youtube video about the philosophy of of side plots in your own life (laughs) non-playable characters see if you can see if you can plot your life out like that yeah, if you can plot your life out like that, what, who's well, your like, main like protagonist? Like, think about it. So, like, when you have a wedding, that becomes the major arch in your life, right? And then everything else is kind of like a little subplot. Until that full story is done. Okay. From the from the engagement to the wedding. That is a, like, full story. A full plot of a story. So, the teller tells George I they love can't... This, 
They can't roll them. But no, she no, they could roll them themselves. Yeah, they won't take the bucket and just like pour it into the machine anymore. They won't do that anymore. Like no. back then they would have done it. I don't know why they won't take them now. Yeah, that's kind of odd. Well, no, they make you roll them. So I, I usually I'll have like a, my big bucket, which is usually like a big coffee can of change. And yes, I've had to roll them myself so that I could take them to the bank and actually cash them or put them in an account. You have to you have to go get the rolls from them. It's so weird. I don't understand this. They used to and, have it where they would you here's my bucket of change and they just throw it at the machine and yeah, count throw it how much it is and then be like here you go. Back. Yeah. Exactly. Which is so how it should be and I don't that. know why it isn't anymore. I really don't understand that. I did like George's line though. What am I supposed to roll 6000 of these? Should I quit my job? <laughs> <laughs> Does and take I, a while. And then I really remember the stand up about the bank about the maze and having to get to the end. Like, there better be a block of cheese at the end of this, because if the bank has the the, z- the back and forth. Right. Uh, the lines. Ropes. Yeah. George is rolling pennies in Jerry's apartment, <laughs> and Jerry tells George he really doesn't want to go with Kevin Dunn at all. He doesn't want to go with Joel. And he's going to tell him he, he's not going either. So he's going to tell him to take the tickets, take somebody else that he wants to take. Mm-hmm. So Kramer comes back in. To say the pizza idea is going to happen. (laughs) That he's found somebody to do the pizza idea. And they fire back. Very animated, I think. Is it George or is it Jerry? That's like, I don't understand how you think that this is going to happen. You're going to have people shoving their hands in an oven. I think it was George. I think George is the one saying, you can't have regular people putting being near the ovens and touching stuff and doing all of those things but it's all supervised <laughs> and jerry tells kramer he can't imagine anybody wanting to do it i disagree I act- yes go ahead <laughs> <laughs> i think it's fun to make your own personal pizza we do this and i i think it's really it's like a, like a little fun thing you can do and actually there was a pizza place when we were younger i don't know if they still do it but they would take parties and you could fix your own pizza. They would put it into the oven. But you got to put all the fixings on and however much you wanted to have and got to make your own little personal pizza. Yeah, I was going to say, I can't imagine that there aren't places or a chain or something where you get to make your own pie. Now, I do agree with George. I don't see them letting you put It's it a in liability. The oven. Yeah, that's a liability. It's a liability. Yeah, yeah. But as far as tossing the dough and putting the sauce on and, and the ingredients, I could totally see this being Absolutely. a thing. It even would if be it's so like, fun. Even if it's like in a touristy, even if it's like a Vegas or a, a city walk or a touristy trappy area. Sure. Or even like in a, a tu- like Times Square or Michigan Avenue, like a place where tourists are gonna be yeah and you're known for pizza yeah you're like known for Chicago. letting them like cook their own pizza yeah like or like making that type of pizza i could definitely see it sure so i do think that kramer has an idea here i'm not against it i i like the idea so he calls up joel and he tells him he can't make the game because he's uh tutoring his nephew <laughs> in uh geometry yeah, you know, the polygons, hexagons, right. trapezoids. And this is where he says he needs an excuse Rolodex, which is yeah, a good idea. It is a good idea. I like that. I, like we've discussed, I very much like Jerry, don't want to do anything. That's been the plus of COVID is having that as an as a, just a... An excuse. It's an excuse, man. The COVID. And you just, it's just, oh, okay. <laughs> so... I mean, sometimes it's true. Like, it is true. Like, I don't want to. Oh, no, yeah. No, I. It an it's not just an excuse. It's just a good excuse when you really don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and now we come to the introduction of Elaine Bennis. Elaine Marie Bennis. I love Elaine. I really do. <laughs> I mean, again, all four of these characters are just so great. And we get Elaine, we get Julia doing it. I think that she's perfect for this because she has these little idiosyncrasies that she does, yes. either with this character or as herself. And I feel like it's with her character because I don't see her doing the same things with her character on Veep. Just like these little facial things or like the way she says the words. She moves her arms around, you know. I don't like know. These Part of things. that I do think is her, though. Oh, absolutely. Too. Absolutely. 
So I feel like she's bringing in some of her own quirks into the character. Absolutely. Which is what you want somebody to do. Yes. Like that's, that's what it makes it, that's what makes it Make distinct. real and feel real. She's picking apart M&Ms. <laughs> she's literally like breaking them in half to eat little bits of it. <laughs> and she's complaining about not wanting to be at Jerry's apartment, but she doesn't want to do anything. Right. Jerry's like, well, we could go to the coffee shop. And, and do what there? And she's like, what were we going to do there? Talk? Yeah. And well, goes, at first yeah, she's like, we well, I'm talk. not hungry, but we could go. And she's like, yeah, we could talk. And she's like, well, I'll go if we don't have to talk. Yeah, she goes, I'll go if I don't have to talk. I'm like, ah, oh, it's me. It's me. I just want to be out there and pretend that I'm actually yeah, we've being all sociable. But I don't yeah. want to talk. Yeah. We're all, I just want to You're doing something, but you're not really doing anything. Right. You just want to... You just feel you like feel you don't it. want to be in you the house. You get that feeling of, like, a presence of being there and doing something constructive. Come on, let's go do something. I don't want to just sit around here. Okay. Want to go get something to eat? Where do you want to go? I don't care. I'm not hungry. <laughs> we go to one of those uh, cappuccino places. They let you just sit there. What are we going to do there? Talk? <laughs> we can talk. I'll go if I don't have to talk. <laughs> we'll just sit there. <laughs> you see Jerry kind of break a little bit. He is laughing. In the background, did you see this? He starts laughing at Elaine's performance. I'm not uh, surprised. I'm not surprised at all. I wrote down that she finds Jerry's list of excuses because Jerry's made a list of excuses. Yep. Because she's going to check the machine. So, and she starts adding to it. And I put that she's pretty adorable here. Oh, she is. Where she's like coming up with these excuses for him. Yes. And she's just laughing at them at the same time. It's hard to tell if she's like, if yeah, she's like legitimately laughing? laughing, or yeah, is it the character yeah. laughing, or but that, and that's why she is so good because I feel like she she like authentically laughs at this yes, stuff. Yes, and... absolutely. And he tells her that he would rather lie the rest of his life than have to tell him <laughs> the truth again. And Elaine gets a little upset because she never was able to make a man cry. She even kicked a guy in the groin once, and, and, and didn't he work. didn't cry. <laughs> I don't remember if she ever makes a man cry at another point in the series, but I feel like that could have been a plot. She might. She might have made Putty cry at some point. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, I think Putty's cried. I think he has. Oh, we're going to have to find out now. We'll find out at some point. Yep. I'm glad you thought the same thing. That makes me feel a little like, "Mm, maybe, maybe. So as they're going to leave, Joel ends up... have taken Kramer to the game based on the phone call. Kramer kind of hit it off with him, and he thinks that, and Hornig, Joel, liked the idea. And Elaine agrees. Elaine actually thinks that it is a good idea, like, to make your own pie, a place where you can make your own pie. So she's on our side here. Yeah. And Joel comes up, and he assumes that, like, oh, this is your nephew, uh huh? When he sees Elaine. Oh, now he knows the excuse. So at least the excuse kind of held up for Jerry. It did. Yeah. Like, he didn't want like, to tell oh, him that it was I see. Elaine. So you have yeah. a lady. Right. And he's okay with it because it's like, well, you did have an excuse. Right. And we establish here that they used to date, but they're still friends. Yep. They make that point. What happens is, is that Hornig, because Joel, because he is oblivious to the outside world about how people feel about him, he starts coming up with like, oh, well, maybe we can all go to a game together. We've got the whole list here. Sure. And Elaine has to realize that, oh, she has to come up with a good excuse. And she can't come up with a good excuse. Yeah. Uh, she's like, uh, Tuesdays are good because we have choir practice. Right. Oh, and yes. Thursday we can't because uh, we have to see if we qualify as or- organ, organ donors. donors. <laughs> and I love that Joel's like, hmm, I really should figure that one out too, shouldn't I? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh, God. And Jerry's like, like I'm you surprised really didn't, should. I'm surprised he didn't go, maybe I'll just tag along with you guys. And yeah, then, really. And then they would yeah. have had to, like, no, you have to make an appointment. You know, you have to do all yeah. these things beforehand. I'm you're surprised thinking that I, didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> you're thinking ahead of them on this one. I did. And he's like, well, let's take a look here. And he pulls out the schedule oh of God. all the dates for the Knicks games, and he starts to go through them, and that's how the show ends. It ends with stand-up. The stand-up is basically accepting you have your these your friends, whoever your friends are. Right. You may not want to see them. You may not want them to be your friends, but they are your friends. And that's the way it is. It's just the way it is. Uh, it's a funny thought. Um, it is. When nowadays, we get to... nowadays, you don't 
people don't think that way, but I feel like back then it was kind of the thought process. I do like the idea though. If you were to joke with your friends about, no, we just are our friend group. I don't want to see you people, but this is just the way it is. Right. I mean, I, as an adult. You're just the people in my life. But as this an adult, I do now. kind of understand it. I love my friends. Yes. Because, but to think about it, if you were to suddenly lose your friends, you'd be screwed <laughs> because it's so oh hard God. to- Yes. You know what I mean? To so meet like I get and find it. and like actually like become friends with somebody. Yeah, you might you gotta meet have, a stranger, right? You gotta have Bumble BFF. Oh god. You might meet a stranger <laughs> though, right? And talk to them for a few minutes. But most likely you're not gonna exchange any sort of number or something be, like that be to different. become friends. That right. I feel like takes more effort and thought and time than it did when I, when you're a kid and you're like oh we'll just become immediately become like on facebook or instagram or right. something like that and then you start talking more because of that but like right. nowadays you're not like and you're like oh, i don't really want to give you that information i don't want you to friend request me yet mm -hmm. yeah it depends the, the older you get the more you're just like nope these are my friends yes and we're done <laughs> i already have three friends that's all i need in an alternate scene what happens is Elaine goes to Kramer's at the end of this while they're trying to make excuses. Elaine's like, oh, I got to go right next door real quick. And Joel asks Jerry if he can ask Elaine out. Jerry basically does like, okay, that's it. It's over. Yeah. We're not friends. We're done. <laughs> and this time Joel's like, all right, fine. But I want my serial killer joke back about a and it's supposed to be like about a joke about like a literal serial killer like he kills people eating cereal yeah, or something I don't remember. something ridiculous like that yeah but joel then walks out and jerry's relieved joel opens the door back up and tells him that he'll bring the tape back because in the alternate scene he borrows a cassette tape from jerry sure and he says he'll bring the tape back next week and jerry's like how like how does he do this yeah he's, he's already like manipulating his way back into a friendship yeah he's like jason from friday the 13th he just won't die that alternative <laughs> that alternative scene would have played better to explain why kevin dunn never shows back up but it's probably not as funny as him taking the schedule out and trying to find another knicks game so i guess yeah, we're just supposed to the assume that game. jerry that maybe the alternate scene happens after the show's over. Sure. So they both happen. Right. It makes sense. It kind of it, it kind of feels like one would flow into the other. Like Elaine would finally come yeah. up with an excuse to like get out of Jerry's to apartment. To get out of the room. Yeah. 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 So I guess you could you could head cannon it into that. But that's the end of the episode. So Rachel, what did you think about male unbonding? I thought it was fine. I thought it actually it, it brings up a lot of social points like we did bring up today. That sure. you kind of start thinking about more and actually like why things are the way they are and how you make friends. And even for a woman's perspective, the same idea. Actually having feminine friends or male friends and just being, okay, well, how, how are we still friends? Do I want you as a friend anymore? All of that kind of social concepts. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of like it. You know what? I really like Kevin Dunn in this episode. I think he plays that character very well because he's so annoying, <laughs> and you could feel it. Um, so, did has so has your opinion changed? Because I remember coming into this, you were like, "Oh yeah, I watched this one. It was just on in the background. I didn't really care." No, I'm thinking. I think I was thinking of a different episode. Oh okay. Yeah. We'll find out. I think it was we're the going, robbery, we're going through or the or the stakeout. It was one yeah. of those. Interesting. Yeah, so um, I mean, like, it, it was fine. I still did think this one had actual funny points to it, so, yeah. I, I mean, I would say it's fine. It's nothing special. No, nothing too I, special. I don't know if it, if, if it would be, like, considered a good one to show people that are unfamiliar with what Seinfeld is. I probably wouldn't show I don't them even this know, one. I don't even know if I would show them season one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get into that. I would say I can't tell yet. If it speaks well of the episode for Seinfeld, if we go off on tangents or not, because we went off on a lot of tangents in this episode. True, yeah. But to your point, it does bring up a lot of different ideas that you because can dive I think, into. I think the whole point is that it's about life. It's about nothing. It's about the little idiosyncrasies that you go through. And if right. it makes you think about your own life and all those little things that are a part of it, I think it's kind of doing its job. It's doing its job. <laughs> 
Well, with that being said, that was mail unbonding. We'll get into the stakeout. But first, let's take a quick break. Continued in part two. <laughs> 